9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolios. We're tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. We've got plenty of ground to cover in today's show. I was in the Ozark mood this morning, so your spoken pictogram for this morning. You've got polls, payrolls, and souls. That's your roadmap there. We'll break everything down as we go along. Stock futures, let's start there. They're edging higher ahead of the testimony from Fed Chair Jerome Powell to Congress. This market move coming on the heels of a tech sell-off that dragged all three major indices lower Tuesday. But investors, they're perking up this morning for the Fed Chair's semi-annual monetary policy address. Wall Street watching for any clues of the timing of rate cuts. Some relief in futures. Well, Powell's comments is also going to set the stage for the election year because results from Super Tuesday lining up a historic Trump-Biden rematch. So let's get right to it. The three things that you need to know, your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills, Jennifer Schomberger and Jared Blickery have more. Well, we've had another tech sell-off, as you both mentioned, but it does appear that the market is going to be in recovery mode this morning, as you mentioned, awaiting those comments from Fed Chair Jay Powell in front of Congress today. Meantime, though, let's focus on the bifurcation that we're seeing in the Magnificent 7, because it may be due for a breakup, as Apple and Tesla led those declines yesterday for the basket of tech-heavy stocks. That weighed down the NASDAQ significantly, and this follows an AI-driven surge in stocks that's raising some questions about whether this market is heading for a bubble. Having said that, many strategists' comparisons of the current market rally to the dot-com bubble of the early 2000s are being viewed as premature. Federal Reserve Jay Powell set to testify before the House this morning in the first of his two-day semi-annual testimony before Congress, where he will tell lawmakers that if the economy evolves as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin lowering rates at some point this year. Though Powell will caution that in order to begin lowering rates, officials need to gain more confidence that inflation is moving sustainably back towards the Fed's 2 percent target. And Bitcoin bulls still charging, the world's largest digital currency reaching a fresh all-time high Tuesday. The price briefly crossing $69,000 yesterday. Shortly thereafter, however, traders hit the sell en masse and Bitcoin suffered a sharp pullback. The price currently hovering about $65,000, $66,000. Well, today's top story, futures are edging higher this morning following a sharp sell-off for all three major averages Tuesday, fueled by dumping of large-cap tech names on Tuesday. The tech sector had its worst day since January 2nd. The Magnificent Seven members, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, leading the group lower here. And there's a few things to really kind of keep in context with this. With a massive run-up that we've had, we were bound to see some profit-taking at this point. It's a larger question of where that rotation out of some of that profit-taking from MAG7 names moves into. A lot of the analysts that we've been speaking of and, and speaking with and strategists that we've been talking with, they're focused in on small caps, healthcare, and financials as well. Yeah, and that's why we've seen a bit of a reframing in terms of the leadership that we have seen in the market and what is going to carry if we do see that next leg higher. There's been lots of focus on the fantastic for taking out the losses here from Apple, from Tesla, and from Google that we've seen since the start of the year. We're coming off the worst day, Brad, that we've seen in just about three weeks. In the Morning Brief newsletter from Miles Udlin this morning, I thought put it in really good perspective just in terms of what is driving this market higher and how big of a role the Fed is playing at this point in the rally. And he was focused on a recent note out from Capital Economics Chief Economist James Riley. And within that, he was talking about the fact that James Riley thinks that we are in bubble territory. We are seeing a bit of a bubble start to form. But his main takeaway here, the main argument he was making was just the fact that Fed cuts aren't necessary condition at this point in the rally for the market to move higher. So we yeah. talk a lot about the momentum trade to the upside. And yes, there is, I think, some relief in futures this morning following the release that we got from Powell and what he is expected to say in his statement here at 10 a.m. Eastern time. The fact that he is likely going to reiterate the fact that rate cuts will be or are likely before the end of the year, but the Fed is going to remain patient. We are seeing a bounce 
off of the uh, off the sell off that we saw yesterday with Nasdaq futures at least leading the way higher. Yeah, and one huge thing especially with the broader theme that has really powered the move thus far over the course of the start of this year. I mean, we haven't even closed out Q3 at this point. We're largely through much of the earnings season here and even as we're tracking against some of those 5-year averages earnings, even if you do factor in, of course, not just only the Magnificent Seven or a basket of names, but the entire S&P 500, looking at some of those earnings and revenue, we're, we're actually trending below some of those five-year averages. So going to be critical to see what is the next catalyst, what's the next theme that emerges that is more of a rising tide for all ships that are out there right now. Uh, and that's something investors are going to be waiting, sitting on the edge of their ergonomic seats. I don't know if this is considered an ergonomic seat or not, but that's what they're going to be waiting for here. They will be. All right. Well, let's talk about what's happening down in D.C. today because Fed Chair Jay Powell testifying before lawmakers today as investors look for any clues on the timing of that first rate cut. Now, his comments comes as the latest reading on private payrolls out this morning showing that the labor market remains resilient. Yahoo Finance reporter Jim Schomberger is live from Capitol Hill with the latest on what to expect from Powell. Jen. Good morning, Sean. I felt a reserve Jay Powell set to testify before the House in the first of his two day semi annual testimony to Congress, where he will tell lawmakers that if the economy turns out as thought, it will likely be appropriate to begin lowering rates at some point this year. Though Powell will caution that in order to begin lowering rates, officials need to gain more confidence that inflation is moving sustainably back towards the Fed's 2% target. Powell will say in prepared remarks, quote, if the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. He says lowering rates too soon can undo the progress seen so far in lowering inflation. At the same time, holding rates too high for too long could weaken the economy. Powell says it's likely that the Fed has reached the peak on the policy rate in this cycle, pointing to the job market, which is coming back into better balance, though he says that demand for workers still exceeds the supply of available workers. Speaking of the job market, we just get a, got a new reading on the job market this morning. Private sector payrolls as measured by ADP, clocking it at 140,000 for the month of February, a bit lower than expected the lion's share of those jobs come Coming from leisure and hospitality, followed by construction. This report coming ahead of the all important Labor Department's job report on Friday. Guys. All right, Yahoo Finance reporter Jen Schoenberger, thank you so much for that report and teeing up what we're watching today. Stick with us in our 3 o'clock hour. Jennifer is going to be sitting down with the representative Maxine Waters of California to break down the state of the economy. Well, futures edging higher pre-market here as we're just about 20 plus minutes outside of the opening bell. This comes on the heels of a major tech sell-off pushing the Nasdaq 100 to its worst day in more than a month here. Now, the market is already on a bit of shaky ground ahead of the Fed Chair Powell's testimony on Capitol Hill set to kick off in just an hour. So how should investors be positioning themselves in the market? For more on this, we've got Peter Chir, who is the... Academy Securities Head of Macro Strategy. Peter, great to get some of your insights as always here. Perhaps we start there. And with the day that we saw yesterday, how do investors who are trying to figure out, OK, is there something broader that's taking place or is this simply some profit taking, especially at the levels that we've been watching in high and lofty valuations? So I'm a little bit nervous about markets. I think the propensity is to have a 5 to 10 percent kind of move down much more than another 5 to 10 percent move higher. We've seen some of these names stretched. I think, you know, I, personally, it's a crusade to get rid of the MAG7 moniker because it really hasn't been working this year, right? It's really been much more about AI and what we've been calling AI deputization, where you see names like NetApp and Dell demonstrate that they have some value to the AI space, so they're doing very well. So I think for this to really broaden, really continue, you're going to see, need, you really need to see success stories on people using AI. And I think it's been mixed there, whether you're getting that cost benefit. So that's why I'm a little bit bearish. I think Powell's going to have to be very cautious. And I'm watching DC to see if we, it gets, you know, divisive at all, because this year it does seem monetary policy is now also a political issue. Peter, you mentioned the fact that you think Powell has to remain cautious here in the testimony today. Is the Fed in control of the market at this point in the rally. And I bring that up just because of the momentum trade, obviously, to the upside here. Anything that the Fed does, or is it necessary, I should say, for the Fed to cut rates in order for the market to keep moving higher? 
No, I don't think it is. I think we're, we're in that right sort of frame where we know rates have likely peaked. And at some time in the next year or two, they're likely to come down. If they go up, it's probably because the economy is doing well, jobs are going you know, great. So we can probably absorb that. I'm probably more nervous if they have to cut more than a couple times this year. It's because the economy really slows, so we might not weather that storm very well. So I think they're actually a minor actor, and it's much more about figuring out, is AI real? How's it going? Where is it continuing? And we all know it's real, and three and five years down the road, it's going to be better. But are people getting the cost benefit right now? And devaluations make sense. All right, so if generative AI is not the top theme of someone's portfolio, then what should be from, from your purview? So what I've been looking at for the last six months to a year, and I think it's starting to take its toll on the market, is what is China going to do? And my view, and I work with 18 retired generals and admirals, so we have kind of some pretty interesting geopolitical insight. China's way out of their morass is going to be trying to sell their own brands. So we're calling it going made in China to made by China. And I think part of that is going to be an effort to suppress sales of U.S. brands within China, elevate Chinese brands within China, but then start moving that beyond that and if you go back to the super bowl i can't even remember the name of the company they had four or five super bowl Timu. ads right Timu, that's it i was afraid i was going to pronounce it horribly so but um <laughs> so i think that's all stretch and it's i think where it's going to hurt is u.s companies selling into china first and then also china, u.s companies selling into emerging markets because china has a lot of trade surpluses with these countries so i think that's where they're going to make this push where they're offer a Maybe it's a value versus quality trade-off and pricing, and I think that could be successful. So I'm a little bit cautious, and the news we've seen on a couple of the Mag 7 stocks seems to play that out, right? Their China sales are going weaker. That could be problematic. Peter, when it comes, though, to the crackdown that we've seen from the U.S. government, obviously Biden strategy, if we see a change up in the White House, not likely to change too much the narrative here towards China. How much do you see the results of the election really moving the market in terms of the expectations and where we could see some of those opportunities? You know, I think China is going to be very difficult. So I think, you know, I, I don't mind owning Chinese stocks right now for a trade. I think they're going to figure a way out of this. I think it's not going to be great for us. Um, but there's that ongoing friction and it's going to be difficult to sell chips or high tech into China. And it probably should be given that state. So I'm looking for, you know, other industries. And Again, if this AI is really proving the efficiencies, we should see a much more broad rally. We should see, you know, the Russell 2000, the S&P average, um, you know, PE go higher, excluding the stocks that have been driving it. So that's where I'll be looking as more broad rally. My big concern is, though, we get yield selling off, because I think the one thing as we think about this election, no matter who wins, we're probably going to see bigger deficits. One might be more because we cut taxes. One might be more because we... Um, raise spending. But I think as it sinks in and the campaigning starts, we're all going to realize we have higher deficits. So I think we're going to see another period like we saw last fall and see the 10-year crack above five, maybe even five and a half percent as that fear hits in probably early to late summer. Just to pick up on that, because this actually perfectly tees up our next conversation, Peter. Just lastly, you mentioned monetary policy as a political issue in this coming general election year as well. What should investors be watching, listening closely for that could steer perhaps their own portfolio strategy as they move to and then through November? So I, I really think it's going to be difficult for the Fed to cut in September or November. They might say they want to, but I believe President Trump has already come out saying that that would just be there to help the Democrats. So I think we have to be, if we're going to get a cut, it has to come in the June, July meetings, and it's probably only 25 each. If we don't get that, I think you really have to go to the position that we might not get a rate cut for the rest of this year. So I think that's kind of the messaging I'm looking for. Are we going to get something sooner? And if he starts talking about end of September, uh, you know, November for a first rate cut, I would bet that doesn't happen because that would play right into the election fears that some people are going to have. All right, Peter Chair, always great to get your insight. Thanks so much for hopping on with us this morning. Academy Securities Head of Macro Strategy. Thanks. Thanks for having me. We're turning now to the latest from D.C. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley expected to exit the Republican presidential race after winning just one state on Super Tuesday. Haley is set to make the official announcement at 10 a.m. Eastern time today. It's according to a report from the Wall Street Journal. Now, this sets it up for another Biden-Trump or a Biden-Trump rematch. We had Anthony Scaramucci, Skybridge founder and managing partner on Yahoo Finance earlier this week, weighing in on who is likely to prevail. Let's take a listen. Mr. Trump is going to lose this election. Uh, Joe Biden will get reelected, and that will be generally good for the markets. 
Not necessarily a huge surprise that Anthony Scaramucci thinks that, but let's bring in Rick Newman here to discuss the top takeaways from these results. Rick, I guess first, uh, Nikki Haley's announcement, not exactly a huge surprise going off right. of what you said yesterday, but what do investors need to know just in terms of this matchup and what that could mean? Well, let's just finish up with Nikki Haley first. Mm -hmm. um, so she's probably, so the reporting is she's not necessarily going to endorse Donald Trump. Um, I'm not sure that matters. The one thing that would matter with Nikki Haley is if she, this is fun speculation, is it possible she could join one of these third label parties or third parties, uh, no labels is the one I'm thinking of, uh, and run as a third party or as an independent? That's unlikely, but that would be quite interesting if it happened because she might take more votes from Donald Trump than from Joe Biden and be uh, decisive in that way. I think Nikki Haley probably, instead of doing that, she probably wants to set herself up for 2028. I think we're going to hear again from her in 2028. Uh, we'll see if she does better then or not. As for markets, um, I, you know, I mean, we're now, the, the primary elections are basically over. They're not technically over, but they are for all intents and purposes over. And it's time to start uh, comparing what would Trump's policies be with what would Biden's policies be. And there are a lot of policies, a lot of things could go one way or another that matter for investors here. Uh, a huge set of tax cuts from 2017 are going to expire at the end of 2025. So the next president has to figure out what to do about that. Uh, do we want more uh, tariffs on imports under Donald Trump? The answer is no, we don't. Um, but, um, but Trump says he wants 10 percent tariffs on all imports, another 10 percent, and possibly as much as 60 percent on all China uh, imports. So do we want another trade war? I don't think so. But, uh, you know, voters, voters can decide. Do they want another trade war or not? Uh, and then the, there are, I mean, immigration is another one. There's a whole slew of issues. Uh, you know, I think the big question is how much attention will actual issues even get, given that, um, for now anyway, what most people care about is the slugfest between Trump and Biden and which of these old geezers is going to fall over first. Sure. Well, I mean, we also know that Trump was hoping for an economic crash within the next 12 months uh, so that he didn't have like to be the next... It looks like he's not going to get it. I mean, stock market at all-time highs. Right. I mean. So all these things considered, where are we going to hear more about where each candidate wants to spend into the economy to, to help bolster certain facets of how we operate on a daily basis here in the U.S.? I mean, it depends how these candidates um, campaign. Um, so, uh, and, uh, you, you know, you kind of can't blame either one of them for attack politics. I mean, Trump's negative campaigning worked in 2016. I mean, you know, think about what Trump did in 2016, his inauguration speech in 2017, American carnage. I mean, Trump's whole message is America's going down the drain and I'm the only guy who can save it. I don't think that's remotely true, but um, there are people who want to believe that. I mean, we talked about this earlier this week. There was this New York Times poll recently that found 51% of Americans think the economy is in poor condition. The, that is the lowest possible answer you could, worst answer you could have given. That's given stock market rallies, uh, stock markets hitting new highs. I mean, inflation is coming down. We have um, labor shortages. Anybody who wants a job can get a job. And a majority of Americans say that's a poor economy. So that seems to be fertile ground for Trump to just keep telling people everything sucks. And the guy who's the incumbent is the reason it sucks. And you need to, you need to uh, elect me again. I don't know if it'll work, but I'm sure that's what he's going to try. All right. Yeah. We'll see what the campaign rhetoric sounds like going forward from here. This is just the start. <laughs> Rick, thanks <laughs> so much. seems like it never ends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seemingly so. Rick, appreciate you teeing it up for see us. You guys. We're going to be watching this closely, as well as cybersecurity company CrowdStrike. We're tracking this one very closely this morning, surging in pre-market, up 23% roughly on strong guidance here. We've got some top trending tickers here on Yahoo Finance next.
Shares of cybersecurity company CrowdStrike surging in pre-market trading, leading its peers Palo Alto and Zscaler higher as well. This comes after the company reported strong fourth quarter results and guidance dispelling fears of spending fatigue in the sector. Our next guest boosted his price target on the stock following these results. We've got Eric Keith, who is the Key Bank Capital Markets Equity Research Analyst, joining us here today. Eric, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, first and foremost, just want to get your read here on what's propelling CrowdStrike and, and how they're differentiating their offering. Yeah, thanks for having me. CrowdStrike delivered strong results last night, and this came despite some concerns from investors following what were some softer than expected results from Pierce Zscaler last week, and also Palo Alto the week prior. And also, we got some comments from Palo Alto on the earnings call that we were entering a period of fatigue when it comes to cybersecurity spend. And secondarily, those comments from Palo Alto also highlighted that there was a, a change in the go-to-market strategy to be a bit more aggressive on their pricing strategy when it comes to the core endpoint market, which is where CrowdStrike is a leader. So these, these results really refute any concerns that we might have that there is a software security spending environment going on. And really where CrowdStrike shines in their leadership is they were really strong in, in, in the endpoint security market. They came to market with a cloud, cloud native unified platform, single agent console that really enables them to start with endpoint security, but really broaden much further and become a platform player going forward. So Eric, you briefly touched on this, but I want to dig a little bit deeper here, just in terms of what this means more broadly speaking for the cybersecurity landscape. How much does this then change the narrative? And in terms of the leadership that we're seeing aside from CrowdStrike, who else do you see as the winners within the space? Yeah, I think these results really just show that CrowdStrike's at executing the market right now, and they are the leader in the security space. And when it comes to the broader security environment, look, we have a positive view on security overall. We think over the medium to longer term, there's a lot of things to be excited about when it comes to security. One, the volume and the severity breaches just continue to increase. Second, we think security budgets continue to outpace IT budgets overall. And third, there's a lot of legacy technology out there when it comes to security. And there's a big need for modern solutions like a CrowdStrike, like a Palo Alto, like a CyberArk that people need to adopt in order to modernize their security stack. So as I mentioned, one of the other names that we really like here is Palo Alto. They have a really broad platform. Customers want to do more with less. And they want to do that on a single platform solution like Palo Alto. And they also have one of the most broadest and comprehensive platforms out there. Um, and then on the smaller cap side of things, we really like CyberArk as a, as a vendor in the identity space. We think identity is super crucial when it comes to uh, implementing a zero trust security strategy. And the competitive environment in the identity space right now is pretty favorable. And we see CyberArk as well executing extremely strong in, in that market and identity. Yeah, cybersecurity, one industry where when you got a company like CrowdStrike saying they're tracking a 75% increase in cloud intrusion attempts, that bad news is perhaps always good news for them. However, some of the bad news could come in the form of just looking at the comps year over year going forward and the number of deals that they're signing. They, they closed more than 250 deals greater than a million dollars in value. How, how does that set up for some of the comps that investors are going to be looking at on a longer term perspective too? Yeah, well, we think 2023 more broadly suffered some from macro pressures. So we think budgets were relatively tight in 2023, and we think that improves in 24. So we think that at a macro perspective provides some tailwind. But also when we think about the CrowdStrike story in particular, we think we're just getting started in terms of broadening beyond the endpoint security space. And to put some context into that, some of the markets that it's broadening into that we're excited about include cloud security, security analytics, identity, and those three markets alone, uh, it's only an $850 million business for CrowdStrike at the moment, and that more than doubled year over year. So there's an incredible amount of runway here for CrowdStrike to continue to expand on that platform opportunity. And we, we think 2024 is really going to be the year that this platform story takes hold. All right, Eric Keith, great to get you on here to react to the results that we're getting this morning. Keep in Capital Markets Equities Research Analyst. Thanks. And keep it right here on Yahoo Finance for tomorrow. We will be speaking with CrowdStrike's CEO, George Kurtz. That gets underway at 10 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow morning right here on Yahoo Finance. Well, time for today's stock to watch, and that is shares of JD.com. Now the retailer announcing a $3 billion stock buyback program, also announcing better than expected earnings results for its fourth quarter. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with more on that. Maddie. 
Yeah, Shauna, this uh, Chinese-based e-commerce giant is really surging in the free market here. I'm just taking a look on the Yahoo Finance Plus platform. It looks like yesterday after the close, they were down 2% and in the free market trade, they're up almost 16%. So that indicates to me this was a stellar earnings print and that's exactly what we saw. Not only were there beats in terms of revenue, profits, sales, but we also saw some cash giving back to investors with a share buyback program and also with a dividend play as well coming from JD. Now what this indicates to me as well is that they're finding ways to maintain strong pricing power in the face of a wider array of competitors based in China while the economic situation, they're really pushing down consumers on the mainland who are unable to keep up with those higher prices, given, given the broader economic and macroeconomic concerns in that region. We've seen that previously the likes of Alibaba, uh, even Pinduoduo, the owners of the U.S.-based Timo, uh, Timu, rather, were really taking up a lot of market share from JD and JD was able to hear that from the market and really not only keep prices lower but also broaden out their product offerings. They're traditionally really focused on tech. They were able to increase their product mix and that was rewarded in this earnings print and in their stock performance as well this morning and again seeing them up over 15 percent in the pre-market. All right, Madison Mills, thanks so much for bringing us the latest on JD.com and the move higher that we're seeing ahead of the open. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance and much more ahead. We've got the opening bell in just under three minutes. We'll be right back. You hear the club music, you know what time it is. It's time for the opening bell here. You've got Atlas Clear, ticker symbol ATCH, ringing the opening bell at the NYSE. And you've got 15% change. Great organization there. Getting some funfetti at the NASDAQ, ringing the opening bell there. All right, market's open. We've got team coverage here following the opening bell on Wall Street. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills is on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Plus, Jared Blickery on standby at the Interactive after yesterday's big tech sell-off, of course, we're watching how the sector is moving today. Maddie, we'll go to you first. What are you hearing around the exchange? 
Well, guys, I was going to talk about the continued bifurcation we're seeing in the Magnificent Seven, but I was just talking to the guys about this. It's fascinating to continue to see the market just completely not caring about what we see coming from the Federal Reserve. And that is so different than the narrative that we had when the Fed started this record-breaking hiking cycle. We're hearing Jay Powell today continue to say we need more data. We need to see more softness. And the market is opening up after a down day yesterday. They had a reason to continue that sell-off and they're not taking it. We're seeing more money coming in. We're also seeing higher than expected volume in the market open. That indicates to me that we're continuing to see this bullishness. And I think it's likely that in a shocking twist, this is related to the AI play that we've continued to see. Now, going back to that bifurcation in the MAG7, I was mentioning NVIDIA continuing to grow despite that sell-off that we've seen the past couple of days here. Uh, you mentioned CrowdStrike. I know you're speaking with the CEO tomorrow. That name having a hugely successful earnings print, which is not only about the cybersecurity space, but that is inherently linked to the growth and surge that we've seen in AI, both in terms of a play for uh, markets, but also in terms of profits for companies. I'm curious to see what other names are going to come into this space and really tell us that they are going to be able to up their profit margins based off of AI. We haven't necessarily seen that in some of the other names in this market. I'm thinking about an Apple that recently announced they're taking money out of their self-driving cars unit and putting it into AI. Is that just a little bit too little too late for investors? All right, Maddie, thanks so much. Teeing up today's opening bell and actually the opening cross now that we're through it. Jared Blickery at the home base here at the Interactive. Jared, what are you seeing? Well, I'm seeing a marked difference from yesterday. You can see tech expressed through the NASDAQ and also the Russell 2000 small caps, both up 1%, clawing back some of those big losses we had yesterday. As you were saying earlier, earlier in the year, January 2nd was the last time we had a tech sell-off in XLK of that strength. But then look what's number one today, XLK up 1%, followed by E for energy, then materials, communication services, and real estate, all of those outperforming. In fact, as you can see, everything in the green here and just kind of continuing on Maddie's theme of the bifurcation that we see in the mag 7 and just in general in big tech there's Apple uh, really stands out it's trading to the downside not by a lot but just check out this one year chart I've been uh, tracking this support level here at about 165 and we are heading down to that level just about five dollars away and on a three-year basis you can see uh, if we break this level probably heading to what 150 125 something in there so this does have repercussions Apple still a very important bellwether stock for the market I uh, do want to mention bonds here quickly because we have the 10-year t-note yield hovering near one month lows you'd have to go back to February to see uh, <clears throat> what's happening there in terms of the price level that's 4.12 percent for that rate it's down one basis point there we've been seeing rates go down and uh, it's uh, unusual in that the Nasdaq usually does the opposite of what rates do, but we've seen kind of the opposite with that recently. All right, just with a few seconds to go, want to check out what's happening with crypto, give you a quick pick. There we go, quick peek at the Bitcoin price, 67,178. So we'll have to see if any more record highs after yesterday are in the cards, guys. All right, we will, and we certainly are going to be keeping a uh, watch here on the price fluctuations that we've seen, to say the least, in Bitcoin over the last 24 hours. All right, Jared, thanks. Well, let's take a look at some other trending tickers on Yahoo Finance. First up, let's take a look at Abercrombie because it was a blowout quarter from the retailer. The company reporting same-store sales jumping 16% from a year ago, giving a first quarter sales growth guidance of low double digits. Overall, though, a very strong report here from Abercrombie & Fitch showing that nothing is slowing the momentum of this retailer. We know it has been a huge winner amongst Gen Z and millennial customers. You might be asking yourself why we're not seeing a bigger retailer reaction in the share price this morning shortly after the open. Brad, this is a stock that has run up more than 400 percent over the last 12 months. So the turnaround plan under Fran Horowitz, the CEO there, clearly playing out and analysts very encouraged by the progress that Abercrombie has shown so far. Yeah, just an absolute hat tip on this turnaround story. One of the huge things that jumps out to me, uh, besides the fact that people are still purchasing jeans that are ripped at Hollister, that was up 9%, by the way, during the quarter, is the fact that Abercrombie is absolutely, as, as a subset of Abercrombie & Fitch, Abercrombie brands, they're expecting that to continue to outperform Hollister brands and the Americas will continue to lead regional performance. Just to put a number on that fiscal year, 
Abercrombie was up 27%, so 27% year-over-year growth that they saw at Abercrombie. And then uh, they're also expecting the year-over-year growth rate to be higher in the first half of the year, looking at some calendar shifts that they're citing there. But once again, just um, I think, you know, uh, uh, just a story in executive management and really looking at sensing the environment, looking at what's working well, um, and the mix in inventory that they really have to put into this market in an era where there is more direct-to-consumer, there is more competition, especially on digital, and making sure that the omni-channel approach is up to snuff and attracting some new potential customers. Uh, of course, we grew up going to the mall shopping this, but there are a lot of people just going on their phone shopping this now. so Yeah, it's been so impressive just to see what Abercrombie has yeah. done when you compare the story today to what it was just a few years ago, right? You would find it very hard to find millennials five or ten years ago that were still shopping at Abercrombie, a store that they had shopped at during middle school, maybe even early years of high school. And they're back now in their late 20s, in their early 30s, and they're spending their money at Abercrombie. So a total revamp there under Fran Horowitz. They've totally changed the marketing approach as well. And it is working so far. It's reflected in those sales numbers that you were just going through. And Abercrombie specifically, those comp sales, they were up nearly 30%, up 28% in the fourth quarter. I, I mean, I just, look, ripped jeans. They, just, they never had me on ripped jeans. I know we got to wrap. They're the trend. All right. People Stay. are spending them. Yeah, I guess so. But do I pay, you know, 5% less for ripped jeans than I would for the like normal jeans? With the full ones? I'm just saying it's, you know, economics on my front. Stay tuned. Three to five show. They're going to have the executive editor, Brian Sazi, plus Abercrombie and Fitch CEO, Fran Horowitz. We'll put the question to her. Should I pay a percentage less for ripped jeans? Probably won't. There's much bigger things to discuss with her. And let's take another look at another trending ticker that we're watching here this morning. Campbell Soup shares rising despite warning its full year performance is tracking to the low end of its initial guidance range, but saying a possible turnaround should come uh, or could come should the pace of consumer recovery accelerate. This was an interesting one to look at. The net sales were actually down by about 1%, both on a reported and organic basis. Uh, you had net sales increase on a compound annual growth rate two year of about 5%. Organic net sales increased 6% over that time due to favorable net price realization. So putting price into the system, uh, raising some of those prices here, the only thing that really um, is perhaps one of the levers to pull, uh, but volume is really more of perhaps the going concern here. Yeah, I wasn't able to fully offset uh, the fact that we did see that 2% decline in volumes in the most recent quarter. Prices at Campbell's products rising just about 1%. So people were out there. They were buying those ready-to-eat meals that we've been talking about. They were buying the canned goods, yeah. yet not at the rate that was enough to offset some of the weakness that we're seeing across the board. And I think this is just the latest company to really illustrate the fact that consumers remain under pressure. Inflation is still a huge issue for American shoppers out there. They're being forced to make some decisions, cut back on their overall spending. We're even see it, seeing it uh, hit some of these consumer staple stock. And this is a name that's down just about 18%, I believe, over the last last year, comparing that to the outperformance that we've seen uh, overall, obviously, to the S&P, a clear underperformer within that off just about 15%. So we'll see. As long as the consumer remains under pressure, you would think a name like Campbell's Soup, obviously, wouldn't fare too well in the current environment. A name that's been in a lot of people's pantries over the years, and some quarterbacks have even helped to promote a little bit. We're looking at you, Donovan McNabb. Anyway, Eagles fandom, whatever. Coming up, 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 and away. Bitcoin hitting an all-time high this week. How should you play the rally in your portfolio? We've got more on that after the break.
The crypto rally in full swing here. Bitcoin rising more than 50% so far this year, briefly cracking that $69,000 level Tuesday. The cryptocurrency now hovering eh, around $67,000. So how can investors play this rally? Here with some answers. We've got Cosmo Jiang, who is the Pantera Capital Portfolio Manager, Liquid Strategies. Thank you so much for joining us here uh, today, Cosmo. First and foremost, for people who are trying to figure out if this is now the right time to dip the toe into this crypto rally, what would you say to them? Yeah, for sure. Well, first, thanks for having me. Um, I'd say the step one is really just go from 0% to 1%. Um, you know, if we look at Coinbase has done a survey recently, and they've discovered that roughly 20% of Americans own crypto. So there's actually a lot of people who are at zero right now. And it's going from zero to 1%, you can do various portfolio allocation strategies. It shows that there's actually a huge uh, increase in your portfolio's performance and sharp ratio over time. So that's probably step one is for those who are on the sidelines, start learning about it and consider going from zero to one. Um, step two is probably just understanding what else is out there, right? The investment universe in crypto is, is quite wide. While some investors journey ends at Bitcoin, it's important to realize that digital assets are a lot more than just that. There are 400 tokens with more than 100 million market cap. And as the next cycle gets underway, uh, we believe that, you know, and we've seen over the last few cycles that the other coins outside of Bitcoin really can outperform by many multiples um, during the during the different phases of the bull market. Cosmo, I'm curious how you looked at the price action that we saw yesterday. Heavy selling, middle of the day, we're looking some relief here today, but really what that signals about the momentum or the volatility, I should say, that we'll see in Bitcoin going forward. Yeah, no doubt. This is an early stage uh, tech uh, tech asset, basically. And so there's a, there is a lot of volatility in these assets. Um, I would say that, especially as we get closer to the 69K, which is sort of the all-time high for Bitcoin, it's a very key psychological level. Uh, we saw when we hit that yesterday, it sort of rejected off that and, and pulled back pretty sharply uh, because we saw a lot of people um, have leverage build up and, and, and sort of into that moment. Uh, and then when that moment sort of disappointed and didn't break through that key technical level, uh, you know, it sold off and that, that sort of feeds onto itself. I think what's really interesting to see, though, is that that pullback, while severe, um, was really very short lived. If you if your time span is more than you know 24 hours, like we're almost back to very close to recovering from that from that moment. And it just shows that there is a very strong uh, demand for this product. There's very strong demand from a wide variety of investors. And so uh, this rally feels uh, at least like a very sustainable recovery. And so as you look down the list and, and kind of really consider the entire coin market cap out there. Uh, you've got Bitcoin, you've got Ether, which itself is going to see some applications for ETFs this year as well. Some of those applications already being started. And then you've got Solana and you go further out into the spectrum. You can get into the meme coins. You can get into uh, the other crap coins, as they may call them, or as I will uh, kindly call them here. You know, where should investors be be aware of, of some of the other opportunities versus what is fading fast or just on momentum itself? Yeah, absolutely. Look, at, at Pantera, we're very long-term investors. A defining thesis for us really is that tokens are a new form of capital formation. A lot of businesses will never have a New York Stock Exchange listed equity. They will only ever have a token, and that's how they align incentives with management teams, employees, um, token holders like ourselves, as well as token holders being the equivalent of shareholders as well as uniquely to digital assets users. So it's, it's, uh, it is it's a very uh, fundamentally revolutionary form of capitalism and capital formation. Um, our strategy then is really, it's gonna sound very familiar to those who invest in traditional equities or, or traditional equity hedge funds. Really the core of our strategy is finding tokens that represent protocols with real product market fit, strong management teams, a business model that makes sense and a path to attractive and defensible unique economics. Um, I think the key misunderstanding is that people don't realize that there are are a lot of real businesses with real revenue being generated in the industry, and they're represented by tokens. Cosmo Jiang, uh, Pantera Capital Portfolio Manager and Crypto Asset Manager, thanks so much for joining us here this morning. Great, thank you. Well, coming up, a retail round of the latest results, painting a mixed picture on the consumer. Nordstrom, Ross Stores, and Abercrombie all out with their earnings results. We're going to take a deep dive into these three names when we come back.
Getting more insight into the state of the consumer with results from Nordstrom, Abercrombie, and Ross stores. And it was a mixed bag with Nordstrom and Ross stores both issuing stark warnings about the state of the consumer. But Abercrombie painting a slightly different picture for those who love holes in their jeans. Seeing sales for its holiday quarter jump over 20%. For more on this, we're joined by Simeon Siegel, BMO Capital Markets Managing Director here. Simeon, all right, I'll jest for a moment there on the jeans, but still... A great job that the management team there seems to be doing here. But overall, state of the consumer, we've had a lot of retail earnings come across this week. You know, how do you con continue to like wade through some of the reports that we've seen? So, yeah, I mean, you love your, your ripped jeans. I've been watching this. The last segment, this is great. Um, I think clearly other people do as well. But most importantly, we talked about this last week, revenues are up. Most retailers, it's funny. It's like even we look at Nordstrom, we look at Ross, we look at the businesses that have been reporting, you are seeing revenues grow. And so that goes back to, you and I had talked about this, whether it's healthy or not, that's another question, but the consumer is actually spending. And so I think that's an important thing that we have to keep in mind. Simeon, one of the uh, common threads that we've seen throughout this earnings season and really recent moves from management within the retail sector has been this move to smaller stores in order to better resonate with the consumer. Is that a trend when you take a look at maybe what Best Buy is doing, what Macy's doing, and even the success maybe at Abercrombie and Fitch? Is that a sign that that type of move makes sense? And why do you think that is? Yeah, so I think it's a great point. I think the question is, is that happening on the offense or is it defense? Mm -hmm. The answer for the most part is defense. But is it more, the bigger question to me, is the focus on having smaller stores or is it just that there's a focus on being more profitable? And so I told you that the average, the, my, the revenues across the board right now are up. Sales are up in my somewhere between 2 to 4% on average across the group that I've been looking at. But gross margins, when we think about what they're actually generating on this business, that's up a lot. 150 to 200 basis points is sort of where the, is the entry this quarter. So whether it was the whole D2C and venture capital conversation that we saw with startups, or whether it's simply this idea that in this post-pandemic world, companies realize they need to make money on the products they're selling. And smaller stores is a more productive way of doing that if you're not generating the return on the large stores. Doesn't mean there aren't still large stores, but it means these companies that are looking at their incredibly large boxes without the productivity to justify them are saying, you know what, maybe we could do more with less. And I think that is a healthy approach if you're not getting the volume. It seems like consumers are also gravitating, gravitating towards more value hacks, more value consciousness. We've also discussed that at length in the past as well. And it shows up in some of the retailers that, that you track as well. And I'm thinking about Ross and I'm even thinking about TJ Maxx as we got those earnings results days ago as well. Where in that kind of value hack, value consciousness, uh, does that also place more emphasis on not just the deals that are being offered, but the inventory mix that certain retailers are carrying as well? Well, I'm Brad, look at Nordstrom. Nordstrom, the full price sales were down, the rack was up. So I think you have exactly that. It's very easy to look at that divergence and say, absolutely, consumers like value. I think the issue is consumers always like value. Like we always like value. Here you are trying to get 5% off your denim because it's a little bit less fabric in the holes. Like we want to try and find the best deals we can at whatever price level we want to go towards. The interesting thing about TJ versus Ross and versus some others, I don't really think TJX sells cheap clothing. I think they sell expensive clothing cheap. I think that they try to take a higher level, a, a, something you would get and pay full price at a department store and give it to you at a better deal. And so I think that no matter where you are, you want value. And the question is, does that mean you demand discounts? Does that mean that you're not willing to pay up? Right now, the fact that the gross margins are up so much would argue that give a consumer, and, and again, look at your Abercrombie, give a consumer something that they want to buy, they're willing to pay for, and they will. So I think that is encouraging, but I do think we're seeing execution matter a lot. I think we are seeing divergence. And I think that what it means is you're not going to get helped by the COVID stimulus, lack of inventory, you have price points are up for everyone. I think we're now in this element where good companies are thriving and we're seeing it. We're seeing execution matter. And companies that had effectively been just enjoying the benefit of a macro environment where people wanted to spend more and felt that they were more flush with cash, those are the ones that are starting to slow down. So, I mean, when it comes to the discount side of things, how much does consistency matter? And I bring that up when you compare the results, say, from Nordstrom Rack and what we've seen kind of the up and down nature there versus TGX, which has been a bit steadier. Is consistency a massive factor here at this point in the larger macroeconomic cycle? 
So Sean, I love the leading question. The answer is yes. We can move on to the next question now. No, I'm just kidding. So yeah, listen, I mean, like you can see it in the multiples. So what yeah. people are willing to pay for TJX and Ross stores is much higher than what they're willing to pay for Nordstrom. And so that's just looking at the PE. And I think that there is an element here where there's a perception that retail has a lot of fear because it's fashion and therefore there's no consistency. It's not true, right? There's certain companies that it is true for, but if you can show consistency, you get rewarded with a multiple evaluation as if you're a growth business. And so the off pricers, they have growth, but they're actually more rewarded, I think, for consistency. And so that element gives someone an ability to sleep easy at night and just believe that they're a compounder and they're willing to pay for that. The consumer is as well, because the consumer needs to know that they can consistently go and put in the effort to make it to the store. Because again, remember off price wins, in my opinion, because they don't have e-com, not in spite of it, but they don't which means they have to actually go to a store. I need to know as a consumer that I can consistently go and find something that's gonna be worth my while. And so I think consistency for an investor and consistency for a consumer converge, and that's why people pay more for these businesses. So Simeon, given all this and within your coverage, what is that top play then for the remainder of 2024? I think this idea of execution is going to really matter. I think that look for the companies that can appeal to that and give both the investors and the consumers what they want. But I think what is exciting is we are seeing businesses grow revenues and we're seeing other ones not. We're seeing businesses grow revenues at healthy margins and we're seeing other ones not. And so this off price sector, it's gonna be a great compounding sector. We're all be we're behind that. I love that idea. That's a, a structural idea. But it's also nice to see that some companies in the mall, which had been completely given up on, can keep giving you this time and again right now, these results where they're bringing people back in and we're seeing it effectively show up in the results today and in the stocks. All right, Simeon Siegel, BMO Capital Markets Managing Director. Thanks so much for joining us here this morning. Great to see you guys. All right, much more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We are about 30 minutes into the start of trade on the day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Stocks moving to the upside this morning with tech vaulting back from Tuesday's steep sell-off. Investors eager to hear Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell's latest remarks on the timeline for interest rate cuts this year. Let's take a look at some individual trending tickers that we're tracking here today for you. Shares of Palantir, PLTR, moving higher this morning after winning a new Army contract in a deal valued at over $178 million, the company is going to make the military branch's AI-powered deep sensing capabilities. Palantir is also set to unveil even more new customers at its Artificial Intelligence Platform Conference. That is Thursday. Plus, shares of EVgo are in rally mode this morning. The stock hitting a two-month high after surpassing the street's expectations on the top and bottom line. Despite a more troubling outlook for the sector, EV charging provider here believes it's well positioned to continue expanding its network and increase revenues this year. And shares of the maker of Jack Daniels, Tennessee Whiskey, Brown Foreman, falling today. The company reporting sales in its fiscal third quarter below analyst estimates. The company did beat on profits, however, in the quarter, saying that it sees trends normalizing in the liquor industry. All right, let's get to some breaking news here on the employment data. January job openings coming in at 8.86 million. Now that was a drop of by 26,000 from the prior reading, looking back to the December note here, but it was also slightly lower than what the street, excuse me, slightly higher than what the street was looking for. The estimate here was for 8.85 million. So coming in at 8.86 million, the January uh, job opening rate 5.3 percent. That was flat versus the prior month. Pace of hiring coming in slightly below what we saw the prior month here, 3.6 percent versus 3.7 percent reading that we saw back in December. And take a look at layoffs and discharges. That was at 1 percent in January, essentially flat from what we saw in the December. Reading. Joining us now for more on the labor market, our very own Josh Schaefer. Josh, we're taking a look at these data points. Obviously, this is in the rearview mirror. This is a reading on the labor market and the moves that we saw looking back to January. We also got the ADP report out this morning. How does this set us up, though, ahead for Friday? Yeah, I mean, I think overall, when you take a look at this number for January, basically the risks seem, at least to me and some economists out there, to the upside, right? It would be if you were to see more openings than expected, openings increase. I think that might have been what would start to concern people. Remember, for the large part here, we've been looking for that openings number to come down. It was abnormally high during the pandemic. It's been on a trajectory down. You're looking for that, quote unquote, better balance between job openings and job hires. So you would think the market would generally digest this as a positive number, or at least a number that is in trend with what the Federal Reserve is looking for. And I think that's broadly what Chair Powell is saying in his testimony today, and broadly what the trends have been in the labor market. I think that January number that we got in total non-farm payrolls, remember over 350,000, was sort of an eye-popping moment for the job market, and it was a, oh boy, are we picking back up? You had the high wage number, you had a high overall number for job gains in January, according to the BLS, in that non-farm payrolls report. And so really the concern was just, is that happening broadly? Shauna, you mentioned that ADP report, and when you take a look at that this morning, that doesn't seem to necessarily be the trend. We should note ADP's additions have been significantly lower than the non-farm payrolls that we get on Fridays for a while now. So I don't know if that's really an indicator of what we're gonna get on Friday. One interesting note I would highlight from that ADP survey that was out this morning, uh, payments coming up. Wage growth. Wage growth for job changers increased for the first time since November 2022. Uh, ADP chief economist Neil Richardson told me on the press call this morning, essentially, it's not boiling hot, <laughs> but there is an aspect of wages that we do need to keep watching here. And I think that's sort of from the two different data points we got today, maybe the prevailing takeaway for what to watch on Friday is where is wage growth? We know inflation right now has been a little bit stickier than people expected. Wage growth plays a part in that. Is wage growth going to keep coming down or is that going to become a bigger story, I think, is one of the key things to look at. Yeah, according to the ADP data, annual pay up 5.1 percent in this most recent report. Josh, thanks so much for breaking these down. Also, Fed Chair Jerome Powell's testimony on Capitol Hill just began mere minutes ago. He is set to update lawmakers and investors on the possibility of interest rate cuts this year. As earnings begin to hold sway over market moves, how much 
of an impact will data and the Fed's expectations have going forward? Joining us now, we've got Dan Niles, who is the Satori, founder, uh, fun, Satori Fund founder and senior portfolio manager. Dan, great to have you on here with us this morning. Uh, first and foremost, when you think about what the markets are clearly looking to more to really gauge where there should be more bullishness or where chips should be taken off the table, what most notably is sticking out to you about how there's more emphasis placed in, in, in different kind of fabrics uh, of what we're seeing take place right now, earnings versus what the Fed is doing? Well, I think you, you bring up a good point. If you look at the last two years, it was really all about the Fed. And what I mean by that is if you look at 2020, uh, uh, two, you had the fastest rate hikes in history. And the Magnificent Seven that year, on average, were down 46%. Then you move forward a year to 2023, and the Fed was on hold. People at one point thought there'd be up to seven rate cuts coming this year. And the Magnificent Seven were up 111%. Again, even though estimates for some companies like Apple and Tesla actually went down all year last year. Now, this year, with those rate cut expectations falling from about seven at their peak to now closer to three, and we'll see if it even becomes three, it may be less than that, just given how strong the labor markets are, earnings are really starting to differentiate all these companies. And so the four of the Magnificent Seven that actually had numbers either hold in Microsoft's case or go up pretty substantially in the case of Amazon, uh, Meta, and NVIDIA, those stocks are all up significantly. Meanwhile, this, the companies where the estimates have continued to go down, in the case of Apple, Tesla, and Google having some issues with their advertising business, those stocks are all down. And in the case of Tesla, almost down 30%. In the case of Apple, down about 12%. So I think earnings this year is going to be the big differentiator versus what the Fed does, because I don't see the Fed doing a whole lot this year. So, Dan, then are rate cuts then maybe not necessary in order for the market's momentum to remain here to the upside? Well, I, I think to some degree, you're exactly right, Shauna, because if the economy is strong, at the end of the day, there's only two things that are, determine stock prices, right? It's earnings and the multiple you put on. And so if the earnings hold because the economy is strong, even if rates don't get cut by very much this year, I think the market can do okay. It's not going to be up 20% or something, but it can do okay because of that. And, but I think you're going to see a lot more bifurcation amongst the stocks in the market where you're not going to be able to have your estimates go down and have the multiple expand because everybody's just bullish about rate cuts coming. So you're really going to have to start to put up the numbers. And that's the good news. This earnings season, you've seen the companies that actually do well with their earnings and outlooks, those stocks are going up. And the ones that aren't, those stocks are getting crushed. So it's a much healthier environment we're operating in versus one where every utterance by Jay Powell is really what's moving the entire market, and they're all moving together regardless of what individual fundamentals are. Dan, is the MAG7 as we knew it sunsetting? <laughs> yeah, I, from the beginning of the year, I've called it the Fantastic Four. And so I've kicked out Apple. Earnings went down all last year. Didn't really matter for the stock, but because the multiple just kept expanding. Same thing with Tesla. The stock actually doubled last year, even though estimates for the December quarter came down about 50% over the course of the year. And then with Google, they're really at a moment where they have to figure out who they want to be. Because right now, they're under threat from the one hand in AI, where they're not really stepping up to the plate and providing accurate results with their AI search product, where other companies, whether it's Perpet Perplexity or ChatGPT, obviously the most famous, they're doing a really good job. So taking some share eventually in that. And then also in advertising, um, where um, in YouTube, you've got ad supported tiers from the likes of Amazon or Netflix or Disney and streaming, taking away some of those ad dollars. And so they've also got an issue. So those three I kicked out. So I'm calling them the Fantastic Four because I'm a superhero fan. <laughs> Dan, what is the catalyst? 
for the momentum in your Fantastic Four to continue here to the upside. There's lots of questions just about valuation. Obviously, NVIDIA putting some of those concerns to rest just a bit, given the most recent results. But when you take a look at some of the other names, a name like Meta, some of the other ones that have outperformed Microsoft, but not to the degree of NVIDIA, what's the catalyst there? Well, I think for each one, it's a little bit different. So I'm glad you brought up Microsoft. It's the one that I worry about the most because Copilot, which is their sort of AI offering that sits on top of their Windows offering, the uptake hasn't been that great. And you're paying a 35 multiple for this company and it's growing sort of in the mid teens. And so I may growth at a reasonable price investor. If you look at NVIDIA for comparison, which that stock is trading at a high 30s PE compared to Microsoft, but it's growing the top line at 90%. So from a growth to PE multiple standpoint, it's actually in better shape. If you look at, um, but Microsoft, obviously they get more than 50, per, they get close to 50% of the profits coming out of OpenAI, which produced ChatGPT. They're doing very well with their AI related services. And so that's why you know, we continue to like it. Um, if you look at Amazon, it's really their Amazon Web Services, which hosts a lot of these AI applications, that's starting to accelerate again after having slowed down for the last couple of years. And so that's a positive for them. And their retail business has leverage for Meta. They're using AI well for recommending videos to you and monetizing um, their ads. And so that's how you can look at all uh, you know, four of the magnificent or the fantastic four, I should call them, <laughs> um, and why they're each one doing differently. And don't forget, we have an election coming up, and that's going to be really great for ad revenues, which really helps Meta out quite a bit. Google, out of the ones I kicked out, is the one I would like to get positive on, hmm. because obviously they'll benefit from an election as well. And if they change some of the issues they're having with their AI product, where they say, look, we're going to provide accurate results and let the users deal with that versus trying to provide politically correct results, that would fix a lot of the issues because people want accurate answers to their questions. And so they can fix that anytime they want. I'm not sure they will, but we'll see. And so that's the more most interesting of the ones that I kicked out. Dan, you mentioned elections, so I got to bring this up. We're looking at a Trump versus Biden rematch here as we look ahead to November. From an investor standpoint, is one better than the other for the market? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I think it depends on the sector you're talking about. So obviously, if you're more in the uh, green energy sector, you know, having a President Trump's not going to be as good as having a President Biden. If you're in the oil and gas sector, a President Trump will be better. And so I think it's kind of a mix. Um, obviously, if you're more related to China for Chinese related stocks, probably Trump is worse. Obviously, he's talking about 60 percent tariffs. And so I think the good news is, again, we kind of know what we're going to get with Trump because we already had him once. We know what we're going to get with Biden because we have him now. And so I think investors can kind of work through that. Um, in general, Republicans are viewed as more business friendly. I think in general, I think I would go with that would work better if we have a split government. Because a split government, quite honestly, is always the best. Because when they really try to start to interfere in business, my feeling is they screw it up. So I'd rather have a split government no matter what happens and who becomes president. And I think that'll be the best thing for the markets. Dan, just lastly, while we have you here, we, we've been rounding up uh, some of the perspectives here on, on generative AI as a theme and whether or not a bubble is formulating and, and what needs to happen to make sure that it, it doesn't burst. Do you foresee any bursting of this generative AI bubble and, and who are the first companies to get impacted as a result of that? Yeah, there, there are a lot of questions in there. So the first thing is, are we in a bubble right now? And the answer is no, in the sense that it's too short. So if you go back to the internet bubble, Netscape Navigator, which was the first web browser, came out in December of 1994. It, it took till March of 2000 for that bubble to really break. And obviously you had pullbacks along the way over the course of the five years. Now, if you look at today, ChatGPT showed up in November of 2022. So we're only about a year and a quarter into this. So it's not even, it's not been five years. The second thing is from a valuation perspective, valuations aren't in bubble territory. So NVIDIA, as we talked about, you know, it's trading at a high 30s PE, but it's growing revenues at 90%. If you go back to the bubble, 
back then, Cisco was the most valuable company in the world. NVIDIA is now number three. Cisco back then was growing revenues closer to 59%, but their forward PE was 138 times at its peak. So that's why neither from a time perspective, it's only been a year and a quarter or a valuation perspective, you can call this a bubble yet. Will we get there? Absolutely, 100% think so. And obviously the companies that went up the most are gonna get hit the hardest, just like you saw during the internet bubble, right? Amazon went down 95% from peak to trough when that bubble broke. Obviously it's done well since then. And so you gotta believe the AI darlings of today they're the ones that are gonna get blasted, but it doesn't mean they can't double or triple from here. If you look at NASDAQ, for example, it was up 570% from the end of 1994 till its peak. The S&P was up 200%. Right now you're sitting at about 30 and 50% for those two respectively. So you could go a lot further before you really end up in true bubble territory. All right, Dan Niles, always great to have you on Yahoo Finance. We hope you come back soon. Satori Fund founder and senior portfolio manager. Thanks so much, Dan. Thank you. OpenAI is on the offense here, on the attack, firing back at founder Elon Musk, one of the co-founders of OpenAI, who last week announced that he is suing the maker of ChatGPT for diverging from its original nonprofit mission for a for-profit organization, OpenAI, responding to the lawsuit in a blog post last night on Tuesday night saying that the company intends to dismiss all of Musk's claims from the lawsuit and to bolster its case, OpenAI is publishing some telling emails from Musk himself. Yahoo Finance's Dan Halley has the latest on that story for us. Dan. Yeah, Shauna, uh, basically OpenAI is coming back or fighting back uh, with the receipts for uh, the various conversations they've had with Elon Musk over the years. This is uh, from uh, everybody, uh, from Greg Brockman to, to Sam Altman. Uh, they're essentially throwing his own words back at him. And at one point they say, uh, Elon wanted majority equity, initial board control, and to be CEO. Uh, in the middle of discussions, he withheld funding. There was supposed to be funding that he was providing. Um, and that Reid Hoffman of LinkedIn had to bridge the gap uh, in funding that was left when Elon was holding that back. Uh, essentially, what the, the initial lawsuit says uh, that Elon Musk filed is that they're in uh, breach of contract, uh, breach of a founding agreement uh, between uh, OpenAI, Sam Altman, uh, Greg Brockman, and Elon Musk, basically talking about how uh, the technology was supposed to be all open to the public uh, and that it was supposed to benefit humanity uh, and not be a, a for-profit. And so uh, in some of these emails, what uh, they go over, in, in particular, uh, an email from Greg Brockman uh, is uh, essentially, uh, I'm sorry, from uh, Eli uh, Sutskever, uh, one of the uh, major uh, players at OpenAI, one of the, the head uh, AI scientists. He essentially says to, to Musk, look, you know, uh, obviously this is supposed to benefit uh, all mankind, but we don't have to be open uh, as we grow our capabilities. We, we can kind of start closing those off a little bit. Uh, and Elon Musk essentially replies, yep, to that, uh, saying, you know, sure, the, he agrees with that. So it, it looks as though uh, OpenAI is just firing back at all the claims that, that Musk has uh, with his, his own words included. And poking holes at some of those claims. All right, Dan Halley, thanks so much for breaking down that here for us. Well, coming up, the latest on the 2024 presidential election, Nikki Haley officially suspending her campaign. We will take a look at Super Tuesday and what that means for investors next.
I am filled with the gratitude for the outpouring of support we've received from all across our great country. But the time has now come to suspend my campaign. Former governor of South Carolina Nikki Haley just moments ago announcing her exit from the Republican presidential race. American voters curious now if she's going to lend her support to former President Donald Trump. She had this to say on the matter. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. Haley dropping out after losing every state but Vermont on Super Tuesday. Let's bring in E.J. Dion. He is at Brookings Institution, senior fellow in governance studies and Washington Post columnist. It's great to have you here, E.J. Thanks so much for making the time to join us here this morning. So two big headlines out. Obviously, Nikki Haley dropping out of the race, setting up this re a rematch between President Biden and former President Donald Trump. So Nikki's Hale, Nikki Haley's exit from the race, what does that mean then for the 2024 election for November? Uh, that means, good to be with you, by the way, that means the election starts right now. Uh, the campaign for the fall starts right now. We are going to have one of the longest campaigns uh, that we've ever seen um, in our history. Uh, and I think what you've got is uh, two nominees where there are a lot of Americans who don't like either of them, and they are the people who are going to decide the election. They're variously called double doubters or double haters. Now, that's not unusual in American elections, although I don't think you compare, can compare any race with Donald Trump in it to any race in the past. But it's rare that you have elections where lots and lots of people love both candidates, maybe Barack Obama and John McCain in 2008. Um, I think what you've seen if, over the last couple of weeks is people going into Biden's weaknesses a lot, above all, his age, um, the Demo his weaknesses among voters he needs, younger voters, Muslim and Arab voters, over his stand on the war on Gaza, a weakening of Latino support for Democrats. What's ironic about yesterday is Trump secured the nomination with a lot of big victories but yesterday also showed some real Donald Trump weaknesses that the vote for Haley um, really described. And she's right that he has to win a lot of those people back. Uh, the core weakness is among, really, a lot of the kinds of people who watch this show. Uh, you'll probably have a lot of campaign ads on this show um, because it's college-educated voters overlapping with suburban voters, and particularly within that group, women voters. Um, if you look at the various counties in these races, I'll just pick three. Fairfax County, near me, uh, where I'm sitting in Virginia, Haley actually got 57% in Fairfax County. Very typical suburban county, but let's say that's too inflected by Washington-style Democrats. Um, Hennepin, Hennepin County in, uh, many, in uh, Minnesota, where Minneapolis is, 45% for Haley. Mecklenburg County, where Charlotte is in North Carolina, 45% for Haley. That's a real problem for Trump. And I was thinking this morning of this primary by Haley as akin to the uh, primary that Ted Kennedy ran against Jimmy Carter in 1980 or that Pat Buchanan ran against President George H.W. Bush uh, in 1992, uh, they both lost, but they both showed fundamental weaknesses in the incumbent. So they both have a lot to overcome. Um, but I think this uh, per Haley's performance um, is going to get a lot of people focused on the problems Trump has and the question of what he can do about them. Does that mean that Trump might need Haley at some point on the ticket? Uh, Trump doesn't really like to pick people who have ever said a bad word about him. And uh, Haley has said a lot of uh, negative things about Trump. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to see a lot of Haley's comments in Joe Biden ads this year. Uh, so it would probably be a good move, but I'd be extremely surprised if he made it. But I quit my membership in the prognosticators union <laughs> after Trump won in 2016. So who knows? But I don't think so. EJ, there has been a number of polls out, a number of opinion polls discussing the economy and the handling of the economy right now. Many voters are not satisfied with the job that President Biden has done so far, and many actually think that Trump 
has did a better job during his presidency with the economy. In terms of changing that narrative for the Biden administration, how tough is that going to be? And what do they need to do in order to change the narrative and get the message across to voters? I think their biggest ally on this is time. Uh, that you are already, it's, it's very hard to shake perceptions that people have on things like this. But what you are seeing now, as inflation has finally ebbed, there's still concern about prices in the supermarket and the like, um, but you've had a turnaround in consumer confidence, as you've reported on, uh, that's really important. Uh, and you've started to see an uptick uh, in um, uh, people's approval of Biden's handling of the economy. I think at the, in the State of the Union uh, tomorrow, uh, you're going to hear Biden talk about that. Um, but I think that if the economy stays, stays steady, which means inflation flat or maybe even going down a bit more, um, the stock market staying reasonably healthy and the job market continuing to roar, um, I think that the Biden people will have a, a better time making the case they need to make in June and in October, most importantly, uh, than they do uh, now. Uh, but at this moment, attitudes toward the economy are so linked to our partisanship. Um, uh, you're never going to persuade most Republicans that the economy is going gangbusters. But there is some movement even among them in response uh, to better economic news. EJ, just lastly, while we have you, you mentioned State of the Union, what Biden needs to say during the State of the Union uh, around the economy. What would you most notably be listening for? What are business executives perhaps going to be listening for, especially as we've gotten fresh news that Elon Musk perhaps not going to be donating money to either party. Uh, right, although he seems to be having a meeting with uh, 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 Donald Trump over uh, some money issues, we'll see. Um, I think Biden has an interesting line to walk because there's a real class paradox in American politics. Democrats are always a party of the working class, going back to FDR, now, working class voters, particularly white working class voters, are Republican. So on the one hand, you're going to hear a lot of Biden appealing, Scranton Joe, as he likes to think of himself, appealing to working class voters, pointing out things like the fact that wages, income has gone up higher at the lower levels of the economy than at the higher levels, which is really unusual. But the other side of this, as I said earlier, is Biden needs a lot of affluent people in the suburbs, including some of those business folks you talked about, uh, to vote for him. And I think he's going to stress the stability of the economy. I don't think he's going to make huge concessions on taxes. He'll probably call for increasing taxes on the very wealthy. But I think he's going to make an argument that he has run a very stable government and that the choice is between uh, chaos, uh, which he'll ascribe to Trump, and stability, which he will claim for himself. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see how leading business figures uh, react to that. I think you will get a share of them uh, coming out uh, for Biden on the grounds of stability, but there will still be a lot of tug for others because they want the deregulation and low taxes that Trump will keep talking about. But I think Biden has a shot with business people in this election that he might not have in others. All right. As you said, E.J., the election begins now. E.J. Dion Jr., who is the Brookings Institution Senior Fellow in Governance Studies and Washington Post columnist. Thanks so much for taking the time. Great to be with you always. Thanks. Got it. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Shares of Boeing down over 20% roughly since the start of 2024. The downward trend mainly coming after the incident in early January where a side panel was blown out mid-air on an Alaskan Airlines flight. The incident leading Boeing to explore reacquiring its supplier Spirit Aero Systems as the company works to improve the safety of its 737 MAX aircraft. Dubai carrier Emirates now voicing its support of Boeing's potential takeover of Spirit Aero Systems. Here with more on what's ahead for Boeing, we've got steeple analyst Bert Subin. Bert, great to have you here with us this morning. First and foremost, the likelihood that we see the finalization of a Boeing Spirit deal. Uh, well, first, thanks for having me back um, on the program. Uh, I, I think it's reasonably likely. Um, I think there's been some questions about whether the DOG, FTC would, DOJ or FTC would, would hold it up. And, you know, we couldn't find any examples of vertical integration really being sort of, you know, a, a target for the DOJ. I mean, I think if you look at sort of what they've gone after, it's been more anti-competitive. This would be essentially the reabsorption of a supplier by Boeing um, you would get likely at the same time a divestiture of of the Airbus assets, and so as far as being allowed, I think it would it would it would ultimately pass through antitrust scrutiny. Um, in terms of whether Boeing would do it, I think they've sort of you know, you know found this to be the the path forward that makes the most sense, um, just because it's become increasingly difficult to you know oversee its supply chain and uh, Spirit is a huge part of that, where they've had some quality escapes over the last, you know, couple of years, um, and so I think this is, you know, an actionable, um, you know, sort of right move for Boeing uh, to sort of get control over things, to get the FAA more comfortable with this production, and to get its customers. You mentioned Tim Clark at Emirates, um, you know, more comfortable with the direction they're going in. So I, I do ultimately think, you know, you have a greater than fifty percent chance of, of Boeing and Spirit ultimately merging, uh, you know, later this year. Or do you see this being a catalyst for the stock in the long run? I think it's it's sort of the first domino on the path to normalization, right? So when the January 5th accident happened at Alaska, the question was, you know, reputationally, what's this going to mean? You know, are you going to see a lot of order cancellations? We haven't seen that yet. And I think part of that is, you know, where do you go? Airbus is sold out for the next decade. And so it's proven difficult to get slots there. Uh, then there was a question of what happens to production. Um, right now, they're frozen at 38 per month on the max, and it could certainly be worse than that. And so it can maybe be a few months until they get to the next leg. But if they reacquire Spirit, if they get greater control over the supply chain, then I think they'll get the blessing by the FA over time to, to, to get those numbers back up. Um, and so, you know, ultimately, I think, is this a catalyst? It's sort of hard to say, you know, as soon as this deal, should it happen, we're closed, the stock's going to pop. I don't foresee that. But I think you'll see a sort of a gradual improvement um, because really the number one thing we've been looking at at Boeing is there's this risk premium that's built into the stock. Um, you know, people are essentially embedding in the fact that they don't know what could happen next. You know, could there be another incident? Could there be something on the quality side? How do you price that in? So I think this would sort of help, you know, lower that risk premium as we go down the line. And so looking for an offset in that risk premium, when we think about any type of acquisition that usually takes place, there's some type of premium that's tacked on. At what point is Boeing paying too much for Spirit? It's an interesting question. I mean, our view has been, you know, the typical buyout premium is about 30 percent. Um, stock was trading, call it 28.50 before we saw the Wall Street Journal, Wall Street Journal article uh, on this uh, start to circulate. And so they're trading a little north of 20 percent premium on that right now. And so I don't think there's a ton of upside to where we are currently for Spirit. Um, now, would they overpay? I mean, you, you look at Boeing, it's $160 billion enterprise value versus Spirit. It's around seven and a half. And so this is still a very small deal for someone like, like Boeing. And so if they were to overpay by a little bit, does that super meaningful? Maybe a little less so. But um, I think that when you start factoring in the fact that, that Spirit owes supplier advances to Boeing of about $220 million, um, they would have to carve off the Airbus assets. You know, I think the ultimate price they pay will... will be sort of in the ballpark we're at now, if not a touch lower. So I'm not anticipating you're going to see this massive premium paid for Spirit should a deal go through. Bird Zuman, always great ad to get you on here. Thanks so much for joining us again on Yahoo Finance. All right, well, United Health Group and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services laying out action plans following the cyber attack on Change Healthcare Unit 
of United Health. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani is here with the latest on that, Anj. That's right, guys. The saga now spanning two weeks and nearly with Change Healthcare out uh, with a little bit coming back. And what Change Healthcare is, uh, just as a refresher, is it's sort of a pipeline for payments and prior authorization processing. And that has really stood at a standstill for nearly two weeks, causing a lot of disruption in the healthcare space. This is a system that providers rely on, pharmacies rely on, uh, the federal system relies on, including Medicare. So what is happening is uh, the uh, health department first came out with a statement yesterday saying they are now involved. This has become such a big crisis. The health department has become involved in it, helping with Medicare providers changing their clearinghouse, so finding a different vendor rather than United Health's uh, change, uh, requesting relaxed prior authorization in Medicare Advantage, as well as requesting insurers provide advanced funding. Fast forward to that's exactly what Optum through United Health is also offering, which is sort of a loan advancement for those providers that have not yet been able to get paid in these last two weeks. In addition to all of that, they're looking at ways to help the providers with the loans. But in addition, looking at what has re uh, sort of been resolved in the process, they uh, United is now claiming that they have gotten some part of it back online. About 90% of claims from providers are now flowing and pharmacies are supposed to be nearly back on track, but that does not mean 100%. So there are some providers still feeling that pain. Uh, they did say that the pharmacy network could be back up as early as Thursday. The, really, the reason why this is so important is because United is in charge of a lot of healthcare dollars, whether you're talking about at the federal level or at the broader healthcare ecosystem level. In addition to change, healthcare is also in charge of a number of other financial payment systems and vendors, uh, either through acquisition or through legacy. And so this makes it an interesting story when it comes to the cyber attacks and how big of a target United United is. The company lost $30 billion in market cap as a result of this, not immediately, but soon after when it was, you know, when the market realized that this wasn't going to just go away and get resolved like other cyber attacks in the past. Still questions remain on how this will impact quarterly earnings, as well as what impact it will have on the industry as it moves towards AI and technology and that, uh, you know, full reliance, how this impacts whether or not providers are going to go back to being more risk averse in that or whether or not they will move forward and just hope for the best. Yeah, the healthcare sector, one of the most vulnerable over the years when it comes to cybersecurity here. Anjali, thanks so much for taking the time breaking this down for us this morning. Coming up, everyone, Foot Locker shares falling more than 27% on its quarterly results. Can the company regain its footing? We'll have the analyst reaction next. I knew you'd like that one. <laughs>
Foot Locker shares slipping this morning as you're seeing shares down by 27% under pressure on its quarterly results here. Despite beating the street's expectations on the top and bottom line, the footwear retailer forecasting weaker full year guidance and pushing back financial targets. CEO Mary Dillon outlined last year. For more, we're joined by Janine Sichter, who is the BTIG Consumer Retail and Lifestyle Brands Analyst. Plus, we've got Tom Nikic, who is the Wedbush Security Senior Equity Research Analyst for Apparel and Footwear. Great to have you both here with us. First and foremost, Janine, got to go to you on this one. You see a report like this come across, the outlook a little sketchy, perhaps, and, and we're taking a look at shares moving down 27%. What's the street latching on to here from, from your perspective? Yeah, I think it's all in the context of the go forward outlook. I mean, for, for some perspective here, this is a stock that rose significantly into earnings um, from a valuation standpoint, was trading well above historical averages. So you had high expectations into the print. And I think they met that for Q4. But the challenge is really the go forward outlook, which you mentioned came in significantly below consensus. And when you break it down with the color they gave on the call, a lot of that improvement that they're expecting is really in the back half of 2024. So we're not getting immediate improvement. The first half of the year numbers need to come down. And then as we think about their 28 outlook um, that they're pushing out two years, a lot of that improvement is also going to come in 2026 through 2028. So we're really not getting the improvement that we would have expected. It's all taking um, more of a delay than we would have would have thought coming into the sprint. Tom, the strategy that is taking place right now, sacrificing margins, at least in the most recent quarter here, in order to clear some of that excess inventory, is that a strategy that makes sense? And is it one that we could then expect going forward, given that they are a little bit more behind than initially thought in this turnaround story? Yeah, I mean, look, like they very clearly had too much inventory. I mean, you know, you would walk through the stores during the holiday season and, you know, I, I've, I've never, you know, felt as claustrophobic in a, in a Foot Locker store as, as I did, you know, walking through the stores in, in November and December. So uh, it, it made perfect sense for them to try to, you know, get their inventory cleaner. Um, I think one of the issues, and this you know, alludes to what Janine said about the uh, the back half weighted guidance, you know, they're also assuming that you know sales trends will get better as the year goes on, as they start discounting less and less. Um, that is somewhat of a risky proposition because you know consumers, you know, consumers like discounts, and you know when you train a consumer to look to look for discounts, it can be very difficult to to rip that band aid off. So. Uh, I think that's another reason why uh, you see the stock under so much pressure today. Tom, just to follow up on that, and, and I will add that my own visits and uh, Yahoo Finance and formal channel checks to the stores revealed the same thing. I'm seeing some models that have come out a year, maybe a year and a half ago, still on shelves right now. What is their plan to not only move through inventory, but also for the stores that are underperforming and, and not profitable make sure that they're kind of identifying where there needs to be a significant shift in the amount of overhead they're putting out there and the expenses in square footage operated and the inventory that goes into those new experiences. Yeah, so look, uh, they, they did say that the merchandise margin pressure and the gross margin pressure will continue into Q1. So essentially saying that, uh, you know, now, now in the early part of 2024, you'll continue to see that discounting to, to move on from inventory. Uh, as far as you know, underperforming stores go. I mean, look, like this this company has been a net uh, store closer uh, for as long as I can remember. You know, I think every year since two thousand and seven, I believe. Like, if if you don't include acquisitions that they've made, uh, they've been a net uh, closer of stores. Um, so th they're continually, you know, pruning the the store fleet and kind of saying, okay, yeah, you know, we want to. Um, uh, uh, you know, be a little bit more prudent, uh, you know, with the, with the size of the store fleet and having, you know, fewer but bigger and more productive doors. I, I think it's the right thing to do, uh, you know, but it does cause some uh, some some near term pain. Speaking of that near term pain, Janine, what is Mary Dillon not doing that she should be doing in order to better advance this turnaround? No, we actually really like her playbook. I think she's doing all of the right things, but she's been dealt a tough deck of cards. And I think the thing that we struggle with with this story is that 
a lot of this is in her control, but there's a huge piece of this turnaround that's not within her control. And that comes down to what the overall athletic footwear market does and then what the brands themselves do. And the elephant in the room right now is Nike, which they've taken down their exposure to Nike, but it's still 60% of their business. Nike's going through challenges right now where they're really suffering from a lack of innovation. So at the end of the day, she can do all of these things. And I think that there's a lot of low hanging fruit, but you're still kind of subject to the overall demand for the brands that they carry and where the consumer is um, in, in the broader landscape. Do they need more Uggs up in Foot Locker, Janine? I mean, it sounds like that's performing well for Decker's company that's just gotten into the S&P 500. Yeah, I mean, look, Uggs were great for them. Uggs were great for anyone who had them in stock over the holiday season. Um, we are Byron on Deckers and, and love that story, but that's not their core competency. What they really do well is athletic footwear, particularly basketball. Um, certainly Uggs will help them a little bit in the meantime, but that's not going to be the long-term solution for them. And then just lastly, Tom, I mean, we're just weeks away from Air Max Day. When you think about big promotions like that that are unveiling new innovation from companies like Nike or, or Adidas, Adidas has some huge announcements this year as well, all of these things considered, how much does that innovation at the manufacturer level move the needle for a retailer like Foot Locker? Oh, I think I think it matters a lot. Um, you know, I, I I look back to when Nike really was you know humming from an innovation standpoint, and I think about some of the Air Maxes that came out. Uh, you know, before COVID, uh, you know, I think about, you know, the the Vapor Max, which came out, uh, I believe it was Air Max Day 2017, mm -hmm. the Air Max 270, which came out uh, on Air Max Day uh, 2018. Those were home runs for, for Nike. Uh, and obviously, you know, uh, uh, Foot Locker was a, was a key part of that. And, you know, you did see, you know, better performance out of uh, uh, Foot Locker. Um, you know, before the pandemic. Um, so uh, I, I think it'll be important to see more uh, innovation out of Nike and, um, you know, kind of help alleviate some of the malaise in the sneaker market overall. Janine and Tom, thanks so much for taking the time here today. Really appreciate it. Talking, you know, one of, uh, one of the special areas of the market, at least for the feats out there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We're about one hour into Fed Chair Jerome Powell's semi-annual testimony to Congress. Here with some key takeaways so far, we've got Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schaumberger. Hey, Jennifer. 
Brad Fed Chair Jerome Powell telling House lawmakers this morning that he expects there will be broad material changes to the Fed's proposed capital requirements known as Basel III. While no decisions have been made yet, just after the comment period recently ended, he wouldn't rule out retracting the current proposal and putting forth a new proposal, calling it a, quote, very plausible option. Take a listen. It's more important that we get this right than that we do it fast. We understand that uh, this is an important uh, rulemaking and it's going to have you know, potential implications for the economy and the people we serve. We're going to take our time and do it right. This after committee chairman Patrick McHenry led all Republicans on the House Financial Services Committee in penning a letter to Chair Powell ahead of this morning's hearing asking him to retract this Basel III proposal, calling it, quote, fatally flawed and that it is due to insufficient economic analysis, transparency, attention to stakeholder input and bipartisan agreement. Now, on the monetary policy side, Chair Powell reiterated to lawmakers that officials will need to see more data to fill fully confident that inflation is moving back down towards the Fed's 2% target before beginning to cut rates. Back to you. All right, Jen, thanks so much for bringing us the latest from Capitol Hill. And Brad, when we take into account what Jen was just saying, the impact that that is going to have on banks here in the long run, obviously something that investors need to keep in mind as we await more details from that. And then also, more largely speaking, some of the market driving commentary here this morning was what he had to say about inflation, the fact that, yes, he still does see like the likelihood of a rate cut before the end of the year, but they need to be more convinced that their fight against inflation, the fight to ease inflation has continued. And we are starting to see or continuing to see improvement on that front before the Fed feels confident in, in orchestrating and having that first rate cut. Yeah, it's entirely redefined how we think about inflation. And this was also one of the areas that was brought up even within the ADP payroll print this morning. Job gains remain solid, pay gains trending lower, but still above inflation. That coming from Naylor Richardson, the chief economist over at ADP and from of Yahoo Finance as well. As we think about the, the way in which the Fed is going to try and get down to its target and how a lot of economists have said, well, should they adjust that target? Should a two-handle or two-and-a-half percent, or at least the scale at which they're looking at the time span, should that be something that they're a little bit more malleable around? I think that's where the Fed, in their data dependency, is going to hear increasing calls about, hey, maybe two-and-a-half is actually pretty good. Maybe that six-month and getting that to two percent is actually good and should suffice for the overall kind of policy pathway that we've been on right now. And a few quick uh, language tweaks here in terms of the statement and what we heard from Powell describing the labor market as relatively tight as opposed to just tight, how he described it during the last uh, Fed meeting, and then also calling growth strong as opposed to solid. So slight language tweets there. Let's take tweaks, I should say. Let's take a quick look at the market here. Rebound following yesterday's selling action. You've got the NASDAQ up just over 100 and the Dow up 162. That does it for us. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo alongside Akiko Fujita. Here's what I'm watching this morning. Fed Chair Jerome Powell faces House lawmakers today. Powell reaffirming the central bank will proceed cautiously as it evaluates whether inflation is cooling appropriately. We'll have more on the latest just ahead. Cryptocurrency is enduring a roller coaster ride this week. The moves come as Bitcoin retreats from its all time high. We're going to dig into what this signals about investor sentiment. And checking in on your portfolio. Discount retailers getting a boost from cost conscious consumers, but which names may be worth a closer look? We'll have more on this just ahead. First, though, let's take a look at where markets are trading. We are 90 minutes into the trading day and the major indices here, green arrows across the board, uh, all three major indices looking to claw back from that sell off we saw yesterday. The Dow up 197 points, the S&P 500 up 37 and the Nasdaq up 133. We've seen some big gains in tech names with CrowdStrike being the biggest mover of the day so far, up more than 15 percent right now. Let's take a look at where Treasury markets are right now. Uh, we've obviously been watching that one very closely in conjunction with the Fed chair's testimony on the Hill. The 10-year yield uh, pulling back here at 4.11% and the 30-year yield at 4.26%. The top story we are watching today, though, employment numbers, job openings not changing much in January. We're talking about private payroll numbers here coming in just under 8.9 million, according to the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. We also got private payroll numbers from ADP, adding 140,000 jobs in February. That was up from the upwardly revised 111,000 in January, but a bit below the estimate for 100. 50,000. And Rochelle, of course, we always kind of look at this midweek ahead of the all important jobs report that is coming out on Friday. A few things that caught my attention in that report we got out today, obviously leisure and hospitality seeing the biggest gains, at least within the private sector here, 41,000 new jobs added construction also getting a bump 28,000 jobs. We've started to see a bit of a contrast between the large and medium sized companies that are still continuing um, to hire at a rate, uh, rapid rate, you could argue, small firms lagging behind. Um, and then the wage jumps that we saw among mm. those who are switching jobs, they're seeing a bigger bump in that new job. We're talking about a 7.6% gain, at least in wages, although some would argue that's a sign there's more part time jobs that are coming through. It's true, because you raise a good point about the looking within the sort of shifting dynamics, not just that people are, are leaving some of these jobs, but some of the dynamics are playing when it comes to what that means for the jobs that are left behind, the quality of the job openings that we see. Um, something that I was also focusing on were the uh, revisions. Job openings have been revised lower six of the past eight months. So I think too early to say that we're seeing a, a substantial softening in the labor market. It is still tight, but at least some slackening in some of the sectors that we're watching and perhaps some of that obviously playing into what we could hear from uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell's testimony, um, which continues at the moment. Um, but I do think it's interesting that when people think about the job openings picture, we're looking at people who are underemployed, people who are perhaps still living off their pandemic era savings and perhaps waiting for an opportunity. So we'll continue to track that, but obviously all plays into part of the Fed's big picture as well, Akiko. Yeah, no question about that. And of course, it is about the quality of jobs as well, in addition to the jobs added. And that's something that I know a lot of economists have been watching about. You know, we're seeing these gains. The numbers may be good, but if you look under the hood, there's a lot more part time jobs that are coming through that may, you know, seem to point to employers looking for a little more flexibility right now. Yes, the job market may be still resilient, but things starting to pull back. And that's kind of the trend that we have been seeing. Indeed. Well, we are just one hour into Fed Chair Jerome Powell's semi-annual testimony to Congress. Powell offering more insight on the central bank's thinking on policy rates. Here with some key takeaways so far is Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schonberger. Jennifer, what stood out to you so far? Rochelle, Fed Chair Jay Powell really sticking to his guns, not offering any new color on when exactly the Fed could begin lowering rates. Uh, Committee Chair Patrick McHenry tried to push the chair on what would force the Fed to begin cutting rates. Chair Powell really sticking to the script, saying that officials need to see more data, more evidence that inflation is moving sustainably back towards the Fed's 2 percent target, saying that they could pretty much take their time. Take a listen. 
We want to see a little bit more data so that we can become confident and so that we can take that step of beginning to reduce policy rates. It's a very important step. We think because of the strength in the economy and the strength in the labor market and the progress we've made, we can approach that step carefully and thoughtfully uh, and, and with greater confidence. Now, separately on the regulatory side, House Republicans have been pushing Chair Powell on that proposed capital requirement known as Basel III. Chair Powell said that he expects to make broad material changes to that proposal. It wouldn't take off the table putting forth an entirely new proposal, calling that, quote, a very plausible option. Back to you. I know investors hanging on every word there. Appreciate you breaking that down for us. Our very own Jennifer Schoenberger. Well, Fed Chair Powell reiterating the Federal Reserve's stance of patience when it comes to rate cuts in his testimony on Capitol Hill, saying they would like to have more confidence on inflation before any shifts in Fed policy. So what does that signal for the rate cuts this year? We have Vincent Reinhardt, Dreyfus and Mellon Chief Economist. Thank you for joining us this morning. So as we're seeing here, Fed Chair Powell still, still towing that line of, of being cautious and people wondering when is that data going to be enough? What is that signaling to you about the pace of rate cuts ahead? Uh, Chair Powell is in an, a difficult circumstance. The economy pretty much suggests that it would be wise for the Fed to be patient, to slow up in when it actually decides to pivot toward policy ease. But it's an election year. And as a politic leader of his institution, he's got to pick his spots. It's about the tone and feel. Uh, but that's hard to describe, certainly to Congress, that they may move in our forecast in June because it's the slow spot in what will be a terrible uh, campaign season. With that said, though, I mean, doesn't he lose either way? If he, if he keeps rates where they are, he's going to get hammered by one side. If he cuts rates, he's going to be seen as, you know, helping the administration, at least if, if those who are looking at this from a political prism. Yeah. Oh, there, there is no question that the Fed will be blamed for whatever it does, even if it does nothing. That's one reason uh, the legislature sets up an independent central bank. It gets to blame somebody else for the performance of the economy and the level of rates. And you're, you're seeing Congress do that right now. Uh, but think about it. If it waits to the right spot just when they've got confidence, given the macro data that inflation is going to settle to goal, uh, would you want to be the Fed chair to tighten in, in September or October just before the, the election? And if it waits till after the election, doesn't that look political too? The Fed's just in a really tough spot. Indeed. So, Vincent, I know that we've, we've heard uh, Chair Powell talking about the risks of, you know, thinking inflation, the worst of inflation is behind and then having to sort of step in once again. But talk about the risks then of waiting too long versus, versus cutting too soon and the risks that that poses to the economy. Monetary policy is all about balancing risks. And what you want to do is make the mistake that is easiest to fix and least probable. Uh, and we've heard it in this testimony, and it's behind a lot of his responses thus far in, in this morning. If the Fed eases too soon before inflation is assuredly at its goal, market participants are going to rally a lot, be really excited, financial conditions will ease. And if inflation doesn't fall, it's going to be even more stubborn because of the the, the, the easing of financial conditions. And it'll be very difficult and, and damaging to the Fed's credibility to try to take, back, take that back. So that's a hard mistake to fix. Suppose they ease too uh, Vincent, late. We're the economy softens. Hey, they've been behind the curve before. Markets will get used to it. So, Vincent, we're talking about a lot of external factors here. Obviously, the economic data is the data. You're an economist. What does that data tell you about when the Fed should act, uh, putting aside any political questions and then any criticism? I mean, when you look at the data as is, what does that tell you right now? So if this were not an even numbered year divisible by, 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 by four, then I would say that they should wait 
Uh, ideally, if they really want to realign the nominal federal funds rate in light of lower inflation, down by, say, three quarters of a percentage point this year, you should wait till September. Got three meetings left. Do 25, 25, 25. Uh, and, and that way, markets will understand that's all you're going to do on the year. If he does it in September, then he'll be able to explain the whole logic of, of the policy pivot at his Jackson Hole remarks in August when the whole world's watching. Makes a lot of sense. September, however, is peak politic, and it's really tough for the Fed to insert itself in that conversation. And Vincent, we know that we, we tend to see a lot of these moves on jobs numbers, especially the big job number that's going to be coming out on Friday. But from what we've seen so far from jolts and ADP data, what are your expectations for Friday's big jobs number? And what will you be looking for to really signal how Americans are feeling about the economy? So big picture, just pull back, whether it's at expectations of 200 or shady, high or low. The thing to remember is any number that's got three three digits to the to left of the comma, i.e. anything that's 100,000 more, is more than the run rate that, that keeps the economy at unchanged labor market pressure, just given population and growth and, and labor force participation. So the big thing to look at, do we get a three-digit uh, gain in, in, in monthly payroll? If we did, then there's economic momentum and remaining pressures in labor markets. And that seems a pretty low bar. And Vincent, I, I want to get back to what you said uh, about the timing of these rate cuts. You know, if, if there were no external factors at play here, you said September, largely because the Fed chair would be able to explain it at Jackson Hole. I mean, doesn't that suggest how significant the political risk is right now to the economy? And we've had so many analysts on who've said, look, sort of kind of brush it aside in, in terms of what that political what politics is likely to play in the economic trajectory. But, I mean, in our conversation, you're suggesting that that's a significant overhang here. Well, so let's be clear. I am saying that Chair Powell is politic, as in cautious, wanting to protect his institution. I don't, I'm not saying that he's political or certainly not partisan. He's just got to look at the rest of the calendar and say, if I'm going to slip a headline-grabbing piece of news about monetary policy, the pivot toward ease, when do I want to do it for the rest of the year? He's got the luxury to do it uh, because this is not the panic response to bad economic data. This is the planned recalibration of the nominal policy rate at five and, five and a quarter down to uh, 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 to the lower lower prevailing rate of inflation. Yeah, it may not be at its goal yet, but inflation's a lot lower. And if the Fed doesn't adjust nominal the nominal policy rate, the real policy rate will be too high. They just want to get that right. But they've got a they've got some leeway. This is really this decision is much more about tone and feel. When's a good time to get away with it? And that's up to Chair Powell. That's why it's a very hard call. If you t told me, look at the macro data, I'd just say, easy, September or later. Um, if I, I was sitting in the chair's office, I, uh, I'd say, boy, September's a tough month to do it, Mr. Chair. But here's his problem, and, and that will come up again and again. That's a really hard reason to explain. You're not going to tell a bunch of congressmen, I'm going to ease a little bit sooner than I expected because all your colleagues running for office are creating a toxic, toxic air. Can't do it. And so he's going to have to rely on other things like confidence or sort of the unmeasurable things that have adjusted that make them able to ease, we think, in, at, at, at Dreyfus and Mellon in, in, in June. But boy, that's a yeah. very that's a very close call. Yeah, don't envy the position that the Fed chair is in right now. Uh, Vincent Reinhardt, Dreyfus and Mellon chief economist. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate you joining Thank us. You. Thank you. Time now to take a look at today's trending ticker tickers today. We have a couple of AI-focused stocks, Taiwan Semi and Airship AI, both surging this morning. Taiwan Semi got a price target boost. From an analyst at JP Morgan citing its AI revenue expectations and calling it the key AI semi-enabler, the sensor and data management company Airship, 
AI announcing a new contract with the Department of Justice. Um, let's start with this JPM note, uh, Rochelle, because you know we should we should mention. I mean, TSMC already has a 90% market share um, on all AI-related silicon. So this isn't about them expanding their market share, but it, essentially getting more revenue coming through from that AI play they already have in place. Specifically, JP Morgan analysts saying that they expect that revenue to grow to 25% of the total company revenue by 2027, which, you know, when, when you think about how much of the potential we've been talking about, yes, it's a big jump, but... Uh, 25% in the grand scheme of things, maybe not as significant. It's true. I mean, but I, it, do, it does seem as if this note just sort of reiterates, uh, judging by the title of it here, uh, the JP Morgan team led by analyst Gokul Harihan, where all roads in AI semis lead. That was the title of their note here. That's something that we've continued to talk about. When we think about the plans that a lot of these companies are making with generative AI, all roads do come through TSMC. Um, they have an overweight rating. I did think it was interesting that they've highlighted it as TSM emerging as the enabler for almost all AI processing at the data center and edge with meaningful growth from AI, as you mentioned there, in the next three to four years. But and that, as you mentioned there, that exposure that they're looking at, they're expecting that to rise to 25% by 2027. They do like it still has an attractive valuation, especially when you compare it to an NVIDIA. So I can see I can see the optimism there and clearly the stock being rewarded. Um, the other um, ticker that we were looking at, Airship AI, still rallying on that contract that it got with the Department of Justice. Now, for people who aren't familiar with this name, but although it is one of our uh, top trending tickers this morning, it's known for its AI driven video and sensors, a lot of that tied to surveillance. And this actually builds on the relationship that they built with the DOJ in 2023. So really expanding on that and clearly um, rallying. Keep in mind though, this is a cheaper stock to keep in mind, but uh, one that we're definitely continuing to watch. All right, coming up, Bitcoin hitting record highs this week, then tumbling. We explore how the swings impact investor sentiment. That's up next.
Well, Biden Trump presidential rematch appears all but set with Super Tuesday now behind us. The focus now shifts to President Biden's State of the Union address tomorrow. Let's bring in our very own Rick Newman, who's watching this one very closely for us. Um, Rick, what are sort of the, the, the key message? I mean, yes, this is a State of the Union that the president gives, but it's an election year. What's the message the president will try to get out? I think uh, we have to point out that at this point, one thing Biden has to do is play defense in a way, and, and mainly he needs to not have a senior moment uh, on Thursday or at any point until voters uh, decide who they're going to vote for in November. And by the way, I think the same goes for Trump. Uh, I think both of these candidates realize that there is a much higher potential than normal, that something could happen, one of them could do a face plant in public, or something else that could go viral and be the definitive uh, image of this campaign. So I think Biden, um, he, he, he just has to not screw up, basically. We could see some heckling from Republicans. We saw that last year. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it depends on how Biden uh, responds to that. He needs to look vigorous, but if he can't look vigor vigorous, he just needs to, you know, to look like he's hanging in there, clearly. We, I, we're going to hear the same things from Biden we've been hearing from him during the last year. It's just going to be on a bigger stage. Uh, he's going to talk about what has gone right so far, that we have the, the uh, strongest job growth of any president in U.S. history. That is true. He's also going to acknowledge uh, we need to do more work to get inflation down. And I think uh, he's going to be trying to highlight um, what he would do in a second term. And, of course, the tagline for that has been finish the job, which means continue seeing through green energy incentives and new regulations on green energy. Um, he might talk about trying to get prescription drug prices down. I don't think he will mention Trump uh, in this speech. That's not something presidents normally do. They want to make it about themselves, not about the other guy. But once this speech is over, uh, I think Biden's going to come out swinging. And they, his campaign has signaled they are going to attack Trump as hard as they can. So uh, assuming, uh, you know, the president, you know, avoids any sort of face plant here, <laughs> what have we learned then coming off of the back of Super Tuesday and really what voters there show that they're prioritizing that might show up in the speech that we hear? Uh, so the one thing on the Democratic side is there were these um, so-called uncommitted votes in some of the Democratic primaries, at least two of them, Michigan and Wisconsin. That, that was in, uh, excuse me, Michigan and Minnesota. That, that was kind of a protest over Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. That's people who think Biden has been too supportive of Israel and not sympathetic enough to displaced Palestinians. Um, I, I think Biden hears that. I, I don't think that's uh, that tells us anything at all definitive about the general election. But we have seen Biden recently coming out stronger, saying we need to get to some kind of peace deal between these two sides and emphasizing humanitarian uh, aid for uh, Palestinians. So that could be something Biden talks about in the campaign. I mean, other than that, we know the differences between these two guys. Uh, you know, to some extent, it is going to come down to people who think that the Trump economy before COVID was better than it is now. And, they, and immigration is also uh, a big issue in this one. And that is Biden really has to prove himself on immigration because he owns the mess at the southwest border now. So there's a whole range of stuff uh, that uh, that we're going to be hearing through the campaign. But I would just, you know, final word of caution. Not too many people watch the State of the Union address. It's normally pretty boring. Let's be clear about that. Wonks in Washington, D.C. get all excited about it. But um, unless something goes terribly wrong for Biden, eh, it's, it's not going to be definitive in terms of the election. What will be definitive is what happens during the next seven months. It's going to be a long seven months indeed. Always great having your takes. Our very own Rick Newman. Bye, guys. All right, shifting gears, looking at Bitcoin now, clawing back some of the losses from yesterday, at least in the green today, standing at about 66,875. Now, this comes after the cryptocurrency surpassed 69,000, blowing past its all-time peak briefly and then taking a tumble. Our next guest called for Bitcoin to hit 100,000 in 2024, but retail investors still haven't come off the sidelines yet. To break down what the latest swing signal for crypto investor sentiment, Anthony Trenchev, Nexo co-founder, is here. Good to have you back on the show here. So how much of the movements that we've seen so far in this past week are about investor sentiment versus some profit taking or some other factors at play? 
Well, to me, a hundred thousand is uh, you know in the cards for for this year. So I think we have a long way to go. In crypto, we care about purchasing power and sound money. So to uh, um, the inflation adjusted all time high is now at seventy nine thousand um, dollars, and so we have a little bit uh, yet uh, to climb to reach that. If you permit me this joke, but um, I think what is most important here is that the macroeconomic uh, backdrop is perfect. Last time we were this uh, trading on those levels, interest rates were closer to zero. Now they're about five percent. And then you have to think about structurally who's holding Bitcoin. It is people like me who you would have a very hard time convincing to sell their Bitcoin. Push comes to shove, I might buy some put options, but that's as far as I would go. Then the ETFs are just gobbling up all the supply that is out there. And you have some hot money traders uh, on the long and the short side. And those are the ones who are responsible for the wild swings we saw yesterday, for instance. Yeah, the, the, the gains in Bitcoin certainly going to benefit you, Nexo, which is an exchange, right? I mean, what kind of surge in activity have you seen personally for Nexo? And talk to me about that, that, that mix of investors you just talked about. How is this different from what we saw when the last peak was hit in November of 2021? Well, at Nexo, we service uh, close to 6 million clients uh, at present. And, you know, we have Bitcoin holders and believers who went long a very long time ago, you know, as low as $20,000 when they invested. So they're up several hundred percent. What they're doing right now is they borrow against their holdings, which, uh, you know, at the loan to value ratio of about 50%, you can take out uh, the capital that you invested and if, God forbid, you know, we end up with Bitcoin being worthless, I doubt this is what happened, is you have protected your capital. So we see a lot of people that are just borrowing uh, against their crypto. Uh, we see some institutions uh, coming in, you know, companies and startups that have invested in crypto coming on board as clients. But, you know, what eerily is missing is the frenzy of retail buyers, new people coming in, retail buyers. Um, and this is usually indicative of the top. So I think we're still uh, uh, quite far from it. So Anthony, what is going to be that next catalyst that gets more retail investors on board here, especially as we're already toying with some record highs here, what would be the incentive? Well, I think uh, via the ETFs, you have a whole new class of, excuse me for the term, but boomers coming in and they are price agnostic as to where exactly Bitcoin stands today. You know, they're getting their calls from their financial advisors who are telling them allocate one or two percent. Worst comes to worst, it might be, uh, uh, you know, a, the, 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 a failed investment, but it's not going to harm your overall portfolio. And the way it has been performing, it, there is an asymmetric uh, risk reward uh, ratio to be had here. So these are people that are coming in and they have a, a very high thresholds of pain. Same goes for uh, the existing holders. So I think uh, it will continue to go up um, just based on uh, this dynamics. And then at some point, everybody will FOMO, the fear of missing out will become so strong that uh, they will get sucked into the market. Uh, this will go with the creation of leverage. And that is when we will have the interim top. But I again, think we are uh, a bit far from it still. Uh, Anthony, how have um, Bitcoin ETFs affected Nexo specifically? I mean, it, the argument seems to be that there's an easier entry point through ETFs. That means that users, investors don't necessarily have to go through exchanges like Nexo. Has it helped you? Has it provided a bump because of the sheer visibility of something like Bitcoin now? Or are you finding that you kind of have to share the space with some other players now? We are happy to share the space with the Larry Finks of this world because they bring in a whole different set of investors who would not necessarily come to crypto native exchanges. So it's very different. One, they start off from their brokerage accounts, wherever they might be from dollars. It's very easy for them. We have an offering for people who want to actually hold and self custody and have access to the, 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 the underlying assets, which are Bitcoin and all the other different cryptos. So we don't feel like that's a competition, but rather 
a, a, a supplement supplementary way of getting access and we are excited about that. And Anthony, just very quickly, a lot of people wondering about the likelihood and what it might look like for an Ether spot ETF. What are your expectations there? Well, I think that um, the SEC um, will have a very difficult time denying an um, uh, uh, Ethereum uh, spot ETF just based on the same legal rules that uh, force them to uh, 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 to to approve the the Bitcoin ETF. There is uh, existing um, uh, futures based uh, uh, Ethereum ETFs, and just like the analogy is, they can postpone it, but I don't think they can deny it. And I would be very happy to see that happen in 2024. And I think this is what will happen. Anthony Trenchev, Nexo co-founder. Good to talk to you today. Really appreciate you stopping by. Gold is on a tear, racking up five straight days of gains worth 5%, taking the yellow metal to roughly $2,150. Does the rally have legs or is it just another false breakout that leaves bulls frustrated? For this, we've got our very own Jared Blickery on the gold beat today, Jared. Hey, thank you, Akiko. And that is the question because we've had a lot of fake breakouts to the upside in gold. And let me just show you, first of all, here's what's happened over the last few days. In fact, this chart is year to date. You can see how price action was consolidating until very recently, and then it's just exploded to the upside. But if I show you a five-year chart, you can see how we've kind of been here before. And let me put a darker line on here. Uh, it's almost a head and shoulders inverse top that we're seeing. So this would be the left shoulder this would be the head, this would be the right shoulder, and then we've taken off from here. But we've seen several times in the past where we broke to new nominal highs only to get sucked back in, and I think that's what traders might be afraid of this time. And by the way, here's a 20-year chart, and you can see an even bigger potential cup and handle or cup and flag pattern right there that is evolving. So the point is, when you have these really long consolidations, you can have huge breaks to the upside, but when we're measuring this in years, guess what? It could take a little while. Now, here's another thing I'm watching is gold volatility. Let me bring this back to down to a three-year chart. We can see it's a little bit elevated, but nowhere near, near the spike we've seen before. And what's interesting about gold is that when it trends upward, it trends with volat volatility. So it actually gets more volatile as it spikes to the upside. That's the opposite of stock. So gold volatility is actually something that's pretty good for the market. And finally, here's the Van Eck Vectors Gold Miners ETF. So these are the guys who dig it out of the, the ground. Those were the picks and shovels. And this is just a giant sideways chart. So this isn't even like the gold chart where we're breaking above. There's a lot more work to be done here. But that can be where a lot of the action is, uh, especially as gold gets going. You're going to see a lot of these miners really get going as well. Uh, but we can see when I punch up the year to date numbers, just kind of languishing, not a whole lot of winners that we're seeing in this bunch just yet. But you wait, we see higher gold prices, they will catch up. Okay, we'll be waiting and watching. Jared Blickery, thanks so much. And we'll be right back.
Discount retailers are getting a big lift from cost-conscious consumers. Results from the holiday shopping quarter point to Americans increasingly seeking out value while they continue to be squeezed by higher prices. Our next guest is doubling down on those value plays in the face of that macro reality. Let's bring in Joe Feldman, Telsey Advisory Group Senior Managing Director. Uh, Joe, good to talk to you this morning. As we know, all these discount retailers are not created the same. <clears throat> so who are the big names that you think stand to win big in this environment? Well, you know, Costco is leading the way right now, and Costco continues to perform really, really well. They um, cater to a more affluent consumer. Everybody in the is always seeking value, and they provide tremendous value to the consumer. Really high-quality products, great prices. And again, with that more affluent consumer that's seeking that value, they have the capacity to spend and buy that those goods. At the other end of it, you've got Walmart, you've got Target, both performing um, somewhat mixed. Uh, Walmart's been great. Target's the one that's been a little off, although the quarter was a little bit better yesterday. But let's start with Walmart. I mean, Walmart continues to execute really, really well. They're building out their ecosystem. They're capturing more consumers. They're seeing more customers trade in. Um, and trade down to the Walmart customer uh, uh, a product offering that they have. And the grocery business has really been strong. And, and we see that continuing this year. You know, and Target uh, had an analyst day yesterday, and they laid out a pretty solid year. When I said mixed at Target, it's, you know, they sell a lot more discretionary goods, value price discretionary goods. But as, you know, the consumer has been a little more reticent to buy those products these days. So as that starts to kick in a little bit, which we think will happen as the year progresses, Target starts to look a lot more interesting. And that stock's done quite well. So we, we think that the whole complex, uh, the discounters are going to continue to perform well uh, going forward in 2024. And, and in your note, you have uh, Walmart crowned as the king of retail. How does it keep that crown, given some of the competition out there? And, you, and as you mentioned, really a different makeup and mix in a company like Target. Yeah, I, I think what you have at Walmart is you do have a, a staples-oriented company, right? They're the largest grocer in America. But 40% of what they sell is discretionary, and they are serving the customer better and across the board. They're bringing in better quality products. They're bringing in tremendous value. They're laying in technology to operate more efficiently, to have a much faster supply chain, to also cater to the customer better, have more efficient delivery and more better uh, buy online pickup and store offerings. And so you put all that together, lay on this advertising business that they have, health services for the customer, financial services. They're really building out this ecosystem that I think is very sticky um, beyond just who they, we may think of as their traditional core consumer. Uh, we saw Target yesterday announce this subscription service or membership. $49 is what we're looking at. Um, you've already mentioned Walmart and Costco. Obviously, there are subscriptions attached to that or memberships. Um, do, does Target offer the same value for those customers who are looking for sort of that one-stop shop? Is, is there enough of an offering for Target to compete on this level? Yeah, I, I do think Target has, has a, a solid offering and continues to improve it. One of the big comments that they made yesterday was they are planning to lean into the grocery business a bit more, which I think is very important to making that sort of membership model work. Now, let's be clear. They, they've had this Target Circle 360 program. They've been offering, um, you know, for $99 to consumers to have these types of fulfillment options that they're now going to offer for $49. By the way, that $49 is a promotional price that runs through middle of May. Beyond that, I think it's going to go back to the $99. So, you know, they're tweaking the loyalty program and trying to make it more in, uh, inclusive and broader, but it's not quite what you have where at Costco, you, you know, they have travel services. They are, you know, do a great job with rental cars. You can do, you can actually buy a car at Costco. You can do so many other things within the membership program. Same thing even at Walmart, where it's much more like an Amazon Prime membership, you know, in terms of 
the free delivery, fast delivery, but you also have a broader, broader ecosystem with like access to Paramount Plus and, you know, car rental and other things like that, that you can do um, to create a sticky environment. That's not quite where Target is at yet. So I know we're calling it a membership program, but it's really much more about being in the ecosystem and having a delivery program for their, uh, for their consumers. And Joe, as we think about the themes that we focused on with retail, it was inventory management at one point, then it was shrink. And now we keep hearing, of course, about the cost conscious consumer. What are some of the themes that you think are really, really acting as a bellwether for how retailers are doing, especially when you look at and you compare like a dollar general and a dollar tree, people are already pinched. So even for the battle of the dollar stores, where do things land? Yeah, you know, I think that the consumer is, is really the bellwether. I mean, you, we, we watch the labor market pretty aggressively, watch weekly jobless claims. You watch the gas price, um, the level of gas prices to really get a sense of how the consumer is doing. Once we have that in mind, we can then start to see at this point heading into 2024, I think we need to see discretionary sales pick up a little bit. Staples are working. Essentials, household goods, the dollar stores are performing well on that front. They're getting that customer that, that's trying to stretch their dollar, as is Walmart and some of the others we've talked about. But I do think that you know the next leg up for a lot of these retailers is going to be that discretionary side of the business as the consumer starts to, you know, pick up more apparel and home goods and other hard lines products that, you know, that, that they had bought previously. And there was a lot of purchases of those during the pandemic when there was a lot of flow of, uh, of cash in the consumer's wallet. But now with it being tighter, we're st we, we, we want to see that open up again. And we want to see that the consumer is buying those discretionary goods. So that's an area we're watching for. As an example, you know, Costco, Walmart, Best Buy, they've all talked about unit sales of televisions being better uh, and finally seeing positive trend there. That's like an early sign to us that maybe things are going to get better on the discretionary side. Joe Feldman tells the advisory group senior managing director. Um, some good insight there. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Coming up, we're going to be talking about active ETFs and why they may be a strong play for your portfolio. That's coming up after the break. Well, active ETFs are continuing to gain in popularity. According to Morningstar Research, 2023 saw the most active ETF launches than any other year. 
By the end of the year, active ETFs had more than $500 billion in assets under management. But they still only make up about a small segment of the ETF space, roughly 6%. So why is it a good strategy for you to consider? Let's bring in our guest, Daniel Sotoroff, Morningstar Research Senior Analyst, to discuss more. This is part of ETF Report brought to you by Invesco QQQ. Uh, good to talk to you today. Walk us through the case here. Uh, a lot of investors looking at new ETF plays. Why are active ETFs the way to go? So it, it really depends on the investor. I think at the end of the day, the single biggest advantage of active ETFs is just it's the ETF, right? It's this very tax efficient vehicle at the end of the day. And a lot of active managers have really been relegated more toward neutral funds. Um, we're starting to see that change a lot over the last couple of years. One is I think ETFs are just gathering a lot of assets for that tax efficiency. So they've sort of been stiff armed into it, if you want to think of it that way. They've got to move to the ETF vehicle in order to compete with sort of the traditional passive ETF options that we have out there. Think of those from like Vanguard and BlackRock that have just been hoovering up a lot of money over the last you know decade or so. Um, and then the other advantage is now you can be in the ETF and you can potentially still get access to an active manager that, that you may really like at the end of the day. So um, you can kind of have your cake and eat it too, I guess, if you're really into active management. And so for people who aren't familiar with the actively managed ETFs, so the goal was instead of just sort of tracking the movements of the market, you're actually trying to beat that benchmark. What have been some of the, the top performing ones, the ones that you've seen the biggest inflows, especially over the past few months? Yeah, great question. So when you look at the active ETF space, it's really kind of dominated by a couple of firms and they're kind of the ones that we already know about. So think of like dimensional fund advisors. They've been out there for about four decades. Um, they're kind of a blend between active and passive. They kind of pull from both to kind of build portfolios. Um, they're really having the most success in terms of gathering assets out there. Um, and they have broadly diversified low cost portfolios. So that kind of folds into their performance story at the end of the day. Um, on the more discretionary active side we're seeing like capital group and fidelity are coming out with portfolios and really what they're kind of doing is it's kind of cloning you know mutual fund offerings that they already have so they're built on you know great long-term strategies they're using the same management teams there that um we we have a lot of confidence in. i think across a lot of asset classes so it's 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 those are really the winners i think are more of the entrenched uh, uh parties out there that already have a really strong mutual fund lineup outside of that it's really kind of scattered you're seeing a lot of things like covered call strategies single stock etfs a lot of things that are built around derivatives and stuff Stuff. And occasionally you'll see one take off or get really popular, but they're few and far between. It's really more of like the capital groups and dimensional fund advisors at the end of the day that are have been the most successful, I should say, uh, to date. Uh, Daniel, what are some of the other ETF plays you're watching? Um, certainly a lot of investors looking to maybe increase exposure in that direction, just given the choppiness that we've seen in the market recently. How would you yeah. advise them? Yeah, great question. So one of the ETFs I think I sent over to you today was a Vanguard Core Bond ETF. The ticker is VCRB. That's a brand new actively managed uh, ETF from Vanguard that they just launched in December. So if you're looking to sort of, you know, control risk a little bit, because we have been in very choppy markets over the last couple of years, that's a great option. General expectations on that, it's going to be very, very similar to something that you would get from BND or AGG at the end of the day, something that just tracks the broader bond market. Um, but Vanguard's in-house manager is basically what they're going to do is take on some incremental risk, namely in the form of credit risk at the end of the day. Um, so over a long holding period, uh, you'll get a slightly better return uh, than, the, than the broader bond market. And again, this is Vanguard's behind it. They got a great fixed income group that's managing this. And, and true to Vanguard's name, this is a very low cost offering at the end of the day. So it's a great option for anyone who's trying to take risk off the table or maybe manage this as a core component of a broader portfolio. Certainly some interesting options there for people, regardless of, the, of their risk tolerance there. Appreciate you joining us. Daniel Sotaroff, Morningstar Research Senior Analyst. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. All right, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
The EV pricing war escalating in China, with BYD slashing the cost of its least expensive vehicle. Yahoo Finance's Price of Romanian joins us with the details. Now, this isn't the first time BYD has been rolling out a series of these cuts. Yeah, you know, this follows a price cut that they had for um, one of their other uh, other EVs, known as the, uh, I gotta look this up here, the Yuan Plus crossover got that price cut, excuse me, on, on Monday. Now we're seeing the Seagull, the cheapest EV, a new updated version of it, um, cutting the price by 5% here to just under 10,000 US dollars. This is this a uh, new updated version of their, of their, of their entry-level EV. And I'm shocked that the BYD can make money off this thing because it's so cheap. Uh, you know, like I mentioned before, it also comes after the other price cut for the BYD uh, Yuan Plus. And, then, and also this week, Tesla cut prices uh, for its China offerings in Model 3 and Model Y. So a big brewing price war here coming in China, and BYD is just the latest example of another, uh, the top maker there, EV maker in China, having to actually bring prices down too. I mean, Praz, $9,600 for an EV, right? I mean, it, th that is just tough to compete, and you have heard from so many of these Western car makers about the concern about BYD taking those kind of prices to other markets. Obviously, they've already been importing into places like Europe, but it looks like the EU is considering some additional tariffs. Yeah, that's right. They're concerned that they have new evidence that shows that the China Chinese government is, is sort of um, illegally supporting these uh, EV makers in China using things like uh, direct transfer funds, tax breaks, uh, provisions of goods and services at a, at a cheaper below market price to, to help and aid their local Chinese EV makers. And then that's sort of in violation of potentially uh, trade agreements that, that, that Europe has with, with China and places like that. Currently, the, the EU tariff on Chinese EVs is around 10 percent. We'll see if that rises and potentially it will. And in the States, we have a 27.5 percent tariff on Chinese uh, cars. And, and Akika, I know you spoke to uh, BYD's U.S. head here, and, and she had mentioned how they did not want to come to the U.S market, at least at this time, right? So there's a little bit of an interesting kind of back and forth there. We're seeing EU now kind of stepping up protectionist efforts. Uh, are we going to see more in the U.S.? I mean, it's certainly a big market out there. When you figure you could sell an EV for, for less than 10K, that's hard, that's hard to resist. Always great to get your updates. Our very own Prost of Romanian. Thank you. All right, well, let's get you a final check of the markets as we head into the noon hour. As we can see here, green still across the board here. The Dow currently up about 250 points or 0.6 percent. The S&P also rallying there up about 50 points or 0.8 percent. Strongest gainer of the day so far, the tech heavy Nasdaq currently sitting up 152 points or 0.96 percent. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Cooper alongside Akiko Fujita. Stay with us on Yahoo Finance.